Man, I really wish that three arrows posted more often. What does the three arrow symbol represent? Anti-fascism. Is it this one, how societies turn cruel? I think I remember it being this one. I think this one is more about the psychological and sociological things. There might be a few to watch here. I hope he doesn't mind me watching his videos. I sincerely doubt that he would. Communism, fascism, and monarchism? Let me see. I don't see any video by that title. I don't know what that is, Pasadashan. Aren't three arrows a symbol for social democracy? Oh, that's what the arrows are about. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Sorry. I, I, was, I was looking for video titles. Probably I am Weatherford. We, we should probably do that, yeah. Tell people to sub to his channel. Well, unfortunately, the man doesn't really put out videos, so subbing to his channel would be more of a, you know, more of a, a symbolic show of support than anything. What video are you looking for? I'm looking for a video that best introduces us to the parallels between... I'm looking more for a historical set of parallels than a sociological set of parallels. I think I've touched on the sociological extensively. There are a few here that I want to watch. Let me wash my hands. I had to clean up some stuff when I noticed the cats knocked over all of the uh, shit in the bathroom. I didn't wash my hands after because I didn't think it would be dusty, but it was. I said dusty. Not disgusting. They got into a drawer. There's not poop in bathroom drawers. What are you people doing in your bathrooms? <sighs> I want to watch the gun one. We'll watch a few of these and supplement it with some reading. All right, people, buckle in. We're going to be learning stuff today. Hey guys, a special hello to all those new subscribers because since my last video got taken down twice, my subscriber count has more than tripled, but I'll talk about that a bit hey. more at the end of the video. For now, I want to talk about gun control. I'm oh, and make sure to sub to my channel while I shamelessly steal cont from a, uh, content from a more knowledgeable uh, socialist than myself. Reward me. Thank you. Sure, that's a topic of which you didn't hear enough in the last couple of weeks, but nonetheless, there is a certain argument I want to talk about, which started circulating again after the recent school shooting in Parkland, Florida, and which always shows its face when there is a big debate in the US about gun control. Namely, that the Holocaust is an example of what can happen when you disarm the general population. And it's not just Twitter weirdos making this argument. Last month, when asked what the federal government could do to prevent school shootings, Republican Don Young responded, how many Jews were put into ovens because they were unarmed. Now, he later backpedaled and said he was taken out of context, but I think it's pretty clear what point he was trying to make. Was he? The US citizens need guns to defend themselves in case their government becomes tyrannic, and the German experience proves this to be true. And this Alaskan Republican is in good company with his views. About a year ago, Republican Ben Carson wrote a book called A More Perfect Union, in which he wrote, German citizens were disarmed by their government in the late 1930s, and by the mid-1940s, Hitler's regime had mercilessly slaughtered 6 million Jews and numerous others whom they considered inferior. Through a combination of removing guns and disseminating deceitful propaganda, the Nazis were able to carry out their evil intentions with relatively little risk. I feel like most socialist content should be creative commons. If you don't want your message to spread around that you're really a socialist. It is true. I generally do believe that it's more acceptable to restream content that is political. Because political content isn't just about, like, the pure views and monetization, but also the value of the knowledge being spread. You know, it's kind of like how those small YouTube channels that are just college professors uploading their lectures, they would never care about you restreaming. They'd probably be delighted by it. But of course, you should still make an effort to shout out the channel, to praise the person who made the work, uh, and to add whatever you can on your own so you're not just restreaming content. Which, of course, I will, but he's doing the introduction right now, so... Um. Resistance. He later doubled down on this in an interview with CNN. So, but just clarify, if, if there had been no gun control uh, laws in Europe at that time, would six million Jews have been slaughtered? I think the likelihood of, of Hitler being able to accomplish his goals would have been greatly diminished if the people had been armed. Ben Carson is also not breaking new ground with his argument here. The earliest instance I could find was at a hearing for the 1968 Gun Control Act, which sought to ban Saturday night special handguns at which the NIA representative claimed, no dictatorship has ever been imposed on a nation of free men who have not been first required to register their privately owned weapons. Depending on who is making oh. this argument, it changes its form from time to time, like you can see here with Ben Shapiro. Uh, I fear the possibility of a tyranny rising in this country in the next 50 to 100 years. Let me tell you something cares. The fact that my grandparents and great-grandparents in Europe didn't fear that is why they are now ashes in Europe. Now, Ben Shapiro doesn't really say the Holocaust wouldn't have happened. Wait, that's kind of a weird thing to say. Why would you say your Jewish ancestors didn't fear annihilation if they were killed in the Holocaust? I'm pretty sure they would have had... I'm pretty sure they would... Like, Ben's language there implies that his grandparents were, like, naive and unawares. But 
in Germany, the Jews were disarmed specifically. It's not like his grandparents would have just like been like, oh, la di da, you know, Hitler's not a big deal, za, 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 you know, like, I think they would have known. <laughs> I don't think it was their fault they didn't have guns, the state disarmed them. And yeah, it's pretty disrespectful. Jeez, can you imagine dying in the Holocaust and that's how your great grandchild describes, you know, like, well, if only they'd been more afraid and had had guns in a state where they had their guns taken away? Okay, fuck. Oh, Doomling 92, we saw that, yeah, it's just, they're, they're so far behind on the, um, the rise of the Nazi party. They're still in, like, 1919. He says if his ancestors, and by extension the Jews in Europe or Germany, would have foreseen their government turning tyrannic, they may have survived. He also wrote an article defending Ben Carson's statement, and we'll have a look at that later on. It's truly fascinating. But for now, I think all of you get my point. This argument that Hitler disarmed the German population so he could carry out the Holocaust with little resistance is a prominent one. Now let's take this point by point. Are Ben Carson and all those other people correct in saying Hitler disarmed German citizens and could therefore exterminate so many people with little resistance? Not really, but to fully understand the context, we have to go back to the end of World War I. After the defeat of the Central Powers in World War I, Germany had to comply to a number of points which were part of the Treaty of Versailles. One of the terms imposed on Germany by this treaty was Article 261, which said the following. Within two months from coming into force of the present treaty, German arms, munitions and war material, including anti-aircraft material existing in Germany in excess of the quantities allowed, must be surrendered to the governments of the principal allied and associated powers to be destroyed or rendered useless. But the treaty was only part of the motivation for passing stricter gun laws by the German government. By the end of 1918, Germany had just undergone a real revolution which ended the monarchy and also led the Kaiser to go into exile from whom he would never return. Now I don't want to get into the topic of the revolution too much, but just know that Germany narrowly avoided turning communist or breaking out into open civil war. But at the end, oh, the no. Social Democratic Party got back in control by morally very questionable means by the way, and passed legislation in January 1919 requiring the surrender of all guns to the government in an effort to stabilize the country. This in combination with the law on the disarmament of the people which was passed to comply with the Versailles Treaty in August 1920 essentially banned guns in the Weimar Republic. A real disarmament could never be achieved though since there was no prior registration of already possessed guns. And after this law there were numerous groups... Okay, yeah that makes sense. So a couple of things are being pointed out here that I think make a lot of sense when sort of thought of fully. First, um, without a full registry of available firearms you can never totally disarm a population. But second, their motivation here was, in addition to complying with uh, Treaty of Versailles regulations, also to prevent civil unrest from, like, having guns just sort of spread about the population, you know? Because back in those days, guns weren't everywhere the way they are here in America, and they were more expensive to make, too. So they were comparably fewer, and, you know, like, th these, these were a very different time. A century, a century ago, like, you could have a couple hundred rifles in a basement somewhere, and that would be, like, used next month by, like, one of the dozens of, uh, you know, militia groups trying to vie for power, you know? It was, like, things, things were less stable, therefore a, a gun in the hand of a civilian militia group is potentially much more dangerous. Yes, they also couldn't 3D print guns back then. Not to mention, yeah, these would have been bolt-action rifles active in Weimar Germany who wanted and outright tried to overthrow the Republic with means of violence. Now these laws stayed in effect until April 1928 when the German parliament enacted the law on firearms and ammunition, which relaxed gun restrictions but put a very strict gun licensing scheme in place. A big part in getting a license for a gun after that was the reliability of the person asking for the license. So when Adolf Hitler or his goons would ask for a license, the government was able to say, sorry, you're not really reliable enough to not overthrow the democratic order, so no license for you. After Hitler was appointed chancellor in 1933, these laws stayed in place up until 1938, when the law called Reichswaffengesetz severely relaxed gun restrictions for the general population, but got even stricter for enemies of the regime, such as Jews, Roma, or previously convicted homosexuals. Ah, you know what this reminds me of? This reminds me right here of America having very lax gun laws, but historically tightening those gun laws when those guns are found in the hands of people of color. Ronald Reagan, as governor of California, um, implemented um, uh, gun reform when the Black Panther Party started their protests. Um, Additionally, uh, the state of criminalization and the weaponization of the drug war makes felons out of many innocent people, many of them, disproportionately many of them black, um, which keeps guns out of their hands. Uh, yeah. 
And while Jews weren't previously banned from owning guns, after 1933 the Nazis took measures to disarm the Jewish population on a local level. And after 1936 the Gestapo was ordered to don't give out new gun licenses to Jewish citizens. Jewish homes were also raided for guns, although not nationwide. As I said, this was done on a local level. A famous example of someone's home being raided for weapons would be Albert Einstein. In his house they found a very dangerous weapon commonly known as bread knife. Now up until this point, Ben Carson and the likes are both right and wrong. Only a small fraction of German citizens were disarmed in the late 1930s, and for the rest, arming themselves was even- To be fair, Einstein with a bread knife would be like that scene from the Sherlock movie, right? Discombobulate, you know? It's, it's calculating the, the optimal throwing trajectory to have it bounce off the wall and like spin like really hard and kill like 18 SS members at the same time. You never know. Very dangerous. Actively encouraged by the government. On top of that, the Nazis removed the heavy gun restrictions put in place by the previous government and also threw out the need for a license to acquire long weapons and ammunition. This also shows that this statement... Uh, you know, basically what I said is that when tyranny occurs traditionally around the world, they try to disarm the people first. And that's exactly, you know, what happened in Germany. You know, in the, you know, mid to late 30s, you know, they started a program of disarming the people. And by the mid 40s, look at what had happened is greatly oversimplifying the reality of gun ownership in 1930s Germany. The people were armed, even more after the Nazis took over and enacted the Reichswaffengesetz. Just not certain people. And the Nazis never undertook measures to disarm the majority of the German population. Now one might say that Ben Carson and all those other people are not completely wrong, since the main victims of the Holocaust were disarmed. And if they hadn't been, they could have fought back and maybe survived. This also ties in with Ben Shapiro's statement about foreseeing state tyranny. My opinion on that is that people like Ben Carson- Subtitles please? Wait, can you really not understand? Wait, can you really not understand three arrows? This is not at all an indecipherable accent. This is almost perfect, like, phonetic English. It's harder for ESL people? Uh, yeah, let me see if this thing has good subtitles. No, it does not. If it auto-defaults the Spanish, that means that there are not uh, deliberately added subtitles. I'll turn it down slightly. The speed, I mean. And greatly trivialized the predicament that German Jews found themselves in during the 1930s and 40s. They make the Holocaust seem like this singular event while ignoring the systematic program of persecution implemented by a modern bureaucracy, enforced by a well-armed police state, and either supported or tolerated by the majority of the German population. To illustrate again. this, let's look at a couple of events that predated the complete ban of guns for Jewish citizens. And for this, I want you to imagine something. Imagine you're a German Jew in the 1930s and you own a rifle. When would be the best point to start your armed insurrection against Against the Nazi government. And keep in mind that this government is supported by the majority of the population, and in this list of events I've included an event that was caused by a Jew shooting a Nazi diplomat, and pay attention how that played out. January 1933. The Nazis seize power and Hitler is declared Chancellor of Germany. One month later the Reichstag is burning. The Reichstag fire decree is issued. Certain constitutional protections are suspended and the Nazis use the decree to imprison their political opponents. March. The Enabling Act is passed, allowing Hitler to enact laws without the involvement of the Reichstag, meaning Parliament. Concentration Camp Dachau is established by the SS. April. Members of the Nazi Party and its affiliated organizations organize a nationwide boycott of Jewish-owned businesses in Germany. They also pass laws to ban Jewish citizens and political opponents from civil- Notice how quickly this happens, by the way. Like, immediately. Pretty much everyone, I think, agrees the Reichstag fire was a false flag that the Nazi Party used to both take the Reichstag out of commission and justify acting uh, essentially under martial law. So, you know, you have the seizing power and then almost immediately after you have like the full coup, the martial law, the everything, you know. Anything past this point right here is essentially too late. Like this is the point where the government is completely in the pocket of Nazi Germany, functionally in terms of anti-like revolutionary action service positions, as well as limiting the number of Jewish students in public schools and universities. October. The editor's law is passed. Non-Aryans are now banned from working in journalism. August 1933. Former President Hindenburg dies, which puts Hitler in the position of President and Chancellor of Germany. Shortly after, Hitler abolishes the office of President and becomes the absolute dictator of Germany. September 1935. The Nuremberg laws are introduced, which prohibit Jews from marrying non-Jews, as well as putting them under other discriminatory prohibitions. November 1937. The anti-Semitic exhibition The Eternal Jew opens in Munich. About half of the German Jewish population has fled Germany at this point. 
August 1938, law and alternation of family and personal names is introduced, which requires Jews bearing first names of non-Jewish origin to adopt an additional name. Israel for men, Sarah for women. October the same year, the Reich Ministry of Interior... Is Sarah a Jewish name? Obviously, Israel has its associations, but is Sarah? Yes? Wow, I really didn't know that. I've always thought Sarah is a very pretty name. ...invalidates all German passports held by Jews. Jews must surrender their old passports, which are then marked with the letter J, and given back. 10th November 1938. The German diplomat Ernst von Rath is shot by a 17-year-old German-born Polish Jew in Paris. What follows is the Kristallnacht, or Night of Broken Glass. It marks the switch from strong discrimination to outright persecution of Jews. As are paramilitary forces and also German civilians destroy and plunder 7,500 Jewish stores and businesses. Synagogues, Jewish cemeteries and prayer rooms are target of extreme violence and almost 100 Jewish residents lose their lives, while 30,000 Jewish men are arrested and taken to concentration camps such as Dachau, Buchenwald and Sachsenhausen. F I have seen, I, I shit you not, I have seen liberals arguing that this is an argument right here against direct action because of the Nazi diplomat hadn't been shot by the Jew, that the um, uh, uh, night of broken glass wouldn't have happened, which is obviously profoundly retarded. Um, and just endemic of liberal brain rot, uh, uh, you know, but I think it's important to understand that this right here, the night of broken glass was basically inevitable here, the nationwide boycott of Jewish owned businesses that this may have taken place five years after this, but it is an inevitable consequence. El everything was set into place a long time ago by this point. Which is why you need to stop things from getting here. You can't wait till you're here. Here is way too late. After this night, the Jewish community is fined 10 billion Reichsmark in addition to the costs for the repairments. Daily Telegraph correspondent Hugh Green wrote of the events in Berlin. Mob law ruled in Berlin throughout the afternoon and evening, and hordes of hooligans indulge in an orgy of destruction. I have seen several anti-Jewish outbreaks in Germany during the last five years, but never anything as nauseating as this. Racial hatred and hysteria seem to have taken complete hold of otherwise decent people. I saw a fashionably dressed women clapping their hands and screaming with glee while respectable middle class women held up their babies to see the fun. One day later, an order is issued prohibiting Jews from owning weapons of any kind, including swords, by removing restrictions from the majority of the population. Now to me, if I had to pick a point in this timeline where a Jewish individual or a group of individuals could have prevented the Holocaust by putting up an armed resistance, is never. There was nothing they could do against a well-armed state that was just looking for excuses to prosecute and kill them, and the population which overwhelmingly saw them as a physical danger to their society. As soon as the Nazis took over, the German population was exposed to anti-Semitic propaganda more or less non-stop, from newspapers to movies to school textbooks. The Night of Broken Glass demonstrates this perfectly. One German diplomat was shot in a foreign country, and this led to the biggest outbreak in public violence against the Jewish population in Germany up until that point. The slow creeping process of discrimination and infringing on rights of minorities is part of the nefarious procedure of the Nazis. They never pushed it so far that they would run into danger of the majority of the German citizens siding with the Jewish population. On top of- uh? The full extent of their persecution was held as core Nazi ideology from the get-go, but they waited until common opinion had turned against the minority in order for them to go full tilt with it. You see? Much in the same way, the Republicans' agenda for this country has been on the table for decades, but they have to wait until, funnily enough, the material conditions are appropriate for them to get away with it. That's why they spend so, that's why conservative media is so effective at suddenly turning minority rights issues into these pivotal civilization defining uh you know like culture war battles why this trans groomer shit came out of nowhere out of nowhere really all of a sudden uh and now it's being discussed you know at the highest levels of government they're softening you up for what they really want to do they would not be engaging in a massive propaganda campaign to demonize vulnerable minorities simply for the joy of creating the propaganda campaign. It is a precursor to future plans. ...of that, the number of Jews in Germany when the gun law of 1938 was passed was barely over 200,000 in a country of almost 80 million citizens. 
Is anyone seriously going to make the argument that this amount of people, including children and elderly, is able to fight back against a brutal police state supported by the rest of the country and the military and succeeding? And you know, the reason why I'm so sure of this is because all those Germans who were opposed to Hitler weren't able to stop the Holocaust from happening either. They died or fled or just kept quiet. And you might say, well, maybe they wouldn't have been able to overthrow the German government, but they might have been able to kill Hitler or something, if we're just talking about what could have been more or less anything as possible. But putting aside that Hitler would probably have been replaced by Himmler, who was just as bad, there were about 18 assassination attempts towards Hitler. And for Ben Shapiro's remarks, the Jews living in Germany when the gun law of 1938 was passed knew they were living under a tyrannic government. It's not like most of the German Jews had fled the country because of the weather. In the same year, about 10,000 children were sent to Britain unaccompanied by their parents. And this wasn't a school trip. The parents of these children knew that their life was in danger and took this chance to at least give their children the opportunity of escaping from the Nazis. And an RA-15 wouldn't have done anything for them. Those of you who paid close attention during my explanation of the progression of gun control under Weimar Germany might now say, maybe Shapiro and Karsten are both wrong in their statements when observed up close, but don't they have a point? If the Weimar government hadn't put up so strict gun laws, the Jews may have been able to put up an armed resistance against the NSDAP before Hitler became chancellor and therefore preventing the persecution from even happening. Well, you can say that, and certain people would probably agree with you, but Ben Shapiro wouldn't. No, you don't get to punch people in the face just because of their political views. The idea of civilization is we can have disagreements about politics and still understand that violence is not the right solution here. There is such a thing as a government official monopoly on, on violence. You know, the idea that the, the police can arrest you if you violate the law. But I don't get to punch you just because I don't like what you're saying. No, I'm in no way dismissing the fight of Jewish resistance groups, which did exist, as pointless or a stupid thing to do. The sacrifice and the bravery of these people who fought on in the sure face of death should always be remembered. But the notion that the Jews could have saved themselves on a grand scale with putting up an armed resistance to the German government is completely detached from reality and mm -hmm. I agree with this completely. Also, it's important to understand that when you, um... When you say something like, well, all they would have needed to have done is be armed and they could have defended themselves against the Holocaust, what you're suggesting then is that because the American population is sufficiently well armed that it cannot happen here. You understand? The implication then is that because America already does have lax gun laws, we're in a position to make it impossible for any kind of, and therefore, if it did happen, it is a kind of, a kind of victim blaming, you know, well, more could have been done. Um... Yeah. Fun, fun, fun. Purely made to score political points. It also leaves out the fact that the Jews of countries like Poland and France were defended with armies and it didn't do anything for them. Okay, now you know why remarks such as uttered by Ben Carson are incorrect in the sense that Hitler did not really disarm the population. Quite the opposite, actually. Gun laws got more restrictive for Jews, but were only banned from owning guns five years after Hitler took office. And the claim that the Holocaust could have been prevented if they had the same access to guns as the rest of the population stands on historically very shaky grounds. At last, let's look at Shapiro's take on Ben Carson's comments. If you don't know much about Ben Shapiro, he is most known for going on college campuses and making students who don't have media training or experience like he probably has look foolish in front of a camera and is also the editor-in-chief for The Daily Wire. He's very good at thinking on his feet and articulating his points fast, but usually I find his arguments lacking when looked into a bit more. After Ben Carson made his comments, Shapiro rushed to his defense with an article. And I'm not gonna go every line of it, just the ones that I see relevant, but I will put it in the description for you to check out. Shapiro's article is titled, Evil Media Rip Carson Say Jews Didn't Need Guns During the Holocaust. And this headline is bizarre in numerous ways. Firstly, I assume Shapiro isn't talking about himself as part of the media when he's calling it evil. Secondly, I could not find one publication that made the point that owning guns wouldn't have been beneficial to the European Jews in the 1930s and 40s. And that is because Ben Carson himself didn't make that opposite argument. He didn't say it would have been good for them to own guns. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. He said the chances of Hitler having achieved his goal would have been greatly diminished if German citizens hadn't been disarmed. That's what people objected to. 
He starts off by writing, It's difficult to think of a more evil argument than the idea that because Jews living under Nazi rule wouldn't have survived the Holocaust, even if they had been armed, they didn't need guns. Right off the bat, Shapiro casts a moral judgment on the people opposing Carson. Something that I really wouldn't expect from him because he always points out how despicable it is to frame one side of an argument as evil or not caring about a certain group of people enough. Because this is all about the moral disapproval of people who own guns. And that, that's what drips from a lot of these folks, is this idea that if you oppose them on policy, it's because you don't care enough about what happened in Las Vegas. And that really is, that, that's quite disgusting. On top of that, I would say an argument can't be morally good or evil. It can be valid or invalid. Again, I really think this is a point Shapiro would bring up himself. Facts don't care about being morally good or evil, you know? Anyway, he then goes on to reframe Carson's statement as following. Carson, who has been targeted by the media of late on issues ranging from abortion to mass shootings, is now under fire for suggesting that Jews could have used guns during the Holocaust. Again, that's not true, that's not really what Carson said, and that's not why people con him out on his nonsense. Besides that, Shapiro does not mention the disarmament of German citizens at all in this article, probably because he knows it's not true. What he does, however, is essentially storming the entire opposition to Carson, as if anyone would be saying, Jews should have turned over their guns. I think we get the point. I wanted the historical analogies, or um, historical information, I think at this point we're referring mostly to logical problems in the argument. Uh, I want to watch more. Uh, I might be doing this for a little while. I think this is fun. If you don't, you can leave. That's not a passive-aggressive invitation. That's just um, something you can do. Also, because there are 11,000 people watching, I don't know why there are so many, but if you are watching, uh, you should sub to the channel. Seriously, please. I will make a rare, genuine, impassioned plea uh, and only say that... Uh, 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 how, how do I make this sufficiently uh, compelling? I am the only hope at stopping fascism. And uh, I will stop doing this channel if I don't get enough subs. Uh, that's just, I'm just very capricious. I'm very self-centered. You have to hit the button. It's really the only way. You have to hit the button. Uh, and the Vosh Pit. You know, so much stuff gets posted to the Vosh Pit, the second channel. You gotta go over there, folks. You gotta hit the button. Gotta go up. My uh, YouTube channel subs historically waver quite a bit because I get into so many controversies that people leave as often as they join. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to work around. But uh, yeah, I, lo I love you guys. I really do. I love getting to do this. Give me the sub button. Hit it. Hit it. Okay. How society's turned cruel. Let's go. Hey, what's up, guys? What's up? It's Dan. Welcome to the show. So, a couple of months ago, while surfing the interwebs, I stumbled over a video by YouTube's anti-feminist Mesopotamian emperor titled TYT vs. the Nazi Menace. This video came out shortly after the news broke that the Trump administration was separating children from their parents at the border, and the progressive news network TYT did a little piece on it, pointing out how practices like these combined with the extremely hostile rhetoric of the Trump administration are reminiscent of the Nazis' rhetoric and practices. Now don't worry, we're not going to watch Carl's full response, since it's mostly pretty self-defeating stuff, but I'll show some clips to sum up Carl's contention with comparisons like these. The link to the video is in the description so you can listen to everything in context. It's strange as a foreigner watching American media- Fuck! I forgot how fucking cringe Sargon is, holy shit. Carl! Carl! Media. Watching the descent into absolute lunacy from the left-wing media, the, the side of politics that doesn't generally give a shit about the family unit, all of a sudden is really, really bothered. The kids are being separated from their parents at the border. Oh, won't somebody think of the children? Attorney General Jeff Sessions is frustrated that so many critics are comparing the zero tolerance policy of separating children from their parents who then get prosecuted for misdemeanors uh, to Nazis. <laughs> well, I wonder why that is, Anna. I wonder if it's because it's a completely irrational comparison. And I wonder if it's, in fact, devaluing the term Nazi. I mean, the Nazis weren't just people who enforced their own borders. There was actually a lot more to the Nazi party and their philosophy than that. If you can believe it, Anna. It's almost like calling people who are keeping your borders secure Nazis just because they believe in borders and, oh, who else believed in borders? It is, it is genuinely fucking remarkable how Sargon of Akkad hasn't died of his brain failing to regulate his heartbeat yet or something it's just 
it's it's incredible to me, you know what I mean? When you look at Sargon of Akkad in an intellectual sense, you know, he looks like one of those rocks out in the Great Mesa that have like eight tons of rocks supported by a tiny little twig of eroded foundation, you know, or a, or a building in a, in a crumbling city, you know, that just looks like a gust of wind could blow it over. I don't know how anything's going on there. He's framing the specific treatment and rhetoric used by the Trump administration to incarcerate the families of undocumented immigrants. And then he's, he's taking all that and he's saying, uh, condemning people who believe in borders or something. Like, I mean, obviously deliberate dishonesty is a big part of what they've always needed to do. You know, that's nothing like new or special. It's just so profoundly fucking retarded. I have no idea how people could watch this and think this is like some kind of intellect. Ah, oh, yeah, Sargon really hitting the left. He's the big point there. That is what they said. They did say that the concept of a nation having a border is exactly like Nazi Germany, you know? But I've talked to people like this. I've talked, well, I've talked to him, you know? Twice. He doesn't want to talk to me anymore. I wonder why. He swore off debates after that second convo. Um, yes, he did. Um, but, uh, yeah, I've talked to, like, fans of his, you know, they really do... Pigeon! Oh, I see. Pigeon wants to get at the... Pigeon! Pigeon, you goofy little... I don't think Pigeon understands that her behavior is capable of affecting the world physically. Sometimes there will be a door that is um, cracked open, but like one millimeter too narrow for her to get through. And she will stand outside of it for hours screaming. Um, she could probably just fit through by squeezing, you know, but yeah, she just will stare at it. Artemy will barge through doors. Artemy doesn't care. Artemy will open closed doors. He's tall enough that he can actually reach handles um, and try to get in, you know? He rarely succeeds, but he's capable of it. At least he tries to, you know? Um, smart baby. Pigeon, however... All right. Yes, her, her skin is wrinkled, her brain is smooth. Orders. That's right. Fucking Nazis. It doesn't make them the same. You lunatics. You absolute fucking how. Okay, I think you get the idea. And now quite recently, he did another video reiterating that opinion when it comes to comparing the US detention facilities to concentration camps. Now before we move on, I should tell you why this video comes out now and not earlier. After stumbling upon the first video, I thought to myself that this would be a great opportunity to talk about the validity of Nazi comparisons and if I think those hold any water with respect to the current Trump administration. And there are numerous reasons why I had to scrap several attempts and was almost not going to do a video like this at all. The first one being that talking about the rise of the Third Reich and especially the Holocaust in this way is much different from trying to explain other historical events like why the First Crusade happened for instance. These topics bring with it a tremendous amount of responsibility and for me as a layman to attempt to explain these very socially weighted and complex events really implies a great deal of arrogance on my part. And while I always try to frame my videos as my opinion at the time or points to be considered, I can't negate that what it boils down to is the appearance of a lecture. Another even bigger reason as to portray Germany's descent into Nazism as a cautionary tale it's somewhat necessary to explore how people thought at the time, shifts in their moral axioms and inner justifications for their crimes. In doing so, it's very easy for me to come off as wanting to humanize the Nazis and I want to make it extra clear that it's not my goal to shift responsibility or excuse any of their actions. But sometimes it's necessary to take an analytical approach to show- Yeah, this is, uh, this is really important as well. Remember, dehumanization uh, of your enemies is a double-edged sword because even though it can be politically efficacious in terms of getting people to behave you with a desired level of cruelty or derision uh, it also carries the risk of a denying you an understanding of them and b uh, denying you uh, the ability to recognize the warning signs of people acting more like that you know um of course you know here i am rambling non-stop about republicans being evil and this and that but I feel like, at least I try, I don't know if I do a perfect job, but I feel like I try to justify that sociologically in, a, in an appropriate context. To reiterate so that everyone knows exactly what I mean, when I say they're evil, 
What I mean is their desired outcome is something that is axiomatically considered immoral to us. So that is to say, it's not like we both want the country to be better than it is now, and we have different like ways of wanting to achieve that or different understandings of the world or whatever else. It is that there are people out there whose axiomatic drives, their fundamental beliefs, the moral centers that they're trying to drive towards involve your death or destruction. It's not all that uncommon, frankly. If you take a look at, as Three Arrows points out, the Crusades, you will find plenty of historical examples where the issue at hand here is not they haven't realized there's a way to work together. There was nothing you could have said to a crusading knight near Jerusalem in like 1400 or whatever that would have made him realize that it's unethical to kill like Muslims or whatever. I just, I, yeah, well, you know, maybe you could have. Tough sell, though. <laughs> Tough sell. Anyway, for a lot of these Republicans, I think one of their main moral drives is an ousting of degeneracy and a return to traditionalism. And there is simply, at least in their worldview, no traditional America that involves drag queens and trans kids or whatever else, you know? That world they want is a world where those things can't exist. Mutual tolerance isn't on the table there, you know? You can convince them that it's not psychologically harmful to do this or that. You've seen me have these arguments. Has that ever convinced them? Do they even seem to care what the world or evidence states about it? Do they ever seem to give a shit whether or not evidence says it's harmful to do this or to that? It really seems like their driving beliefs are uh, more fundamental than that. Um, and that's what I mean when I say they're evil. Their, their drives and their goals are, um, are, are, are irreconcilable with ours. Um, of course, I'm a moral anti-realist, so technically, you know, I don't believe that ours are any more inherently right than theirs. Um, though I do believe ours tend to be exhibited in a more consistent way, and they certainly seem to be more uh, authentically reflective of what people seem to like, generally, as an aggregate. But, you know, moral anti-realism, what are you going to do? I love being subjectively right. Um, yeah. Anyway, I just want to point that out. Of course, none of this is mutually exclusive to knowing why people act that way. Uh, I think it's critically important to understand what factors might lead a person to uh, develop those axiomatic beliefs. And keep in mind that people's axiomatic beliefs can change. In the chat right now, raise your hand if you used to believe what I just described, a desire to return to traditionalism and purge degeneracy from this country. But as you grew older or something happened or changed, you realized that these were actually fucking bonkers <laughs> desires. Yeah. People can change. Anyone can change about anything. Um, pigeon. Just keep those things in mind. So how we are no different from the people living in Germany before the Nazis seized power and even after. With that said, given the current conversation about what a concentration camp is, my two cents might be interesting to some of you, but I need to reiterate that I'm only able to provide a very narrow view on the discussed subjects since I'm neither an expert on the Third Reich nor a social psychologist. So please take this as what it is. Last disclaimer would be that this is not a response video, per se. With Carl Benjamin, I just have the luxury of having all kinds of terrible right-wing arguments. What's the difference between moral anti-realism and moral relativism? <clears throat> okay. The difference is that the former is based and the latter is cringe. Moral relativism is the belief that actions are good or bad depending on the cultural context uh, in which um, they're applied. So an example of this would be that homophobia might be morally wrong here in the West, but in Saudi Arabia, homophobia is morally correct because in Saudi Arabia, they culturally value that more than we do. Obviously, this is fucking bonkers, and if you think about it for like three seconds, uh, it really obviously falls apart. Moral relativism is basically like you judge the moral worth of behavior based on what is acceptable in these cultures. But again, it's insane. You know, uh, that's what people refer to. There are different types of moral relativism, though. There are historical moral relativism, and it, it gets used in a few ways, but that's generally what people mean. Moral anti realism is just the belief that correct moral positions don't exist in the universe. There is not an epistemically, objectively correct set of moral positions. 
Rather, you develop and hold subjectively things that you desire, and then things can be objectively good in the context of that. So for instance, I don't believe it's objectively true that it's good for humans to be happy. But if you subjectively believe it's good for humans to be happy, there are things that are objectively good towards that end. Does that make sense? So the axioms, the first principles, the properly basic beliefs, those are subjective. They're just a product of your emotional biases. You choose those, whether you know them or not. Uh, but you can make objective arguments in the context uh, of those. I'm not a moral philosopher. That is my understanding of the two concepts. So attitudes condensed into one or two videos. This points just serve as a jump off point for us to talk about a broader subject. So there isn't going to be a lot of debunking today. Now with that disclaimer out of the way, let's talk about concentration camps and after a bout of comparing the current US oh, to Nazi Germany holds any water. It's easy to see why a congresswoman calling the US detention facilities concentration camps would cause such an intense debate in the US considering that the education system focuses so much on concentration camps in the context of Nazi Germany. And naturally, if that's what you associate with the term concentration camp, you would say no, this comparison doesn't make sense. And let's watch a short clip of what I was just talking about. And then Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez stomps on in with her socialist, socialist Gucci boots and is just like, oh my god. Uh the fact that you keep these illegal immigrants on the border while they're being processed in what we will call detention facilities, which I think is most accurate, they're concentration camps. Alexandria, my dear, these are not concentration camps. Concentration camps are not something that people try to get into. What? They want to get there. They're trying to get to those concentration camps. They're trying to get to which America. Which makes them the opposite of what actual concentration camps are. You know, the, the actual concentration camps are actually a way of killing people, Alexandria. They're a way of genociding people or telling them to work serfs, which again is not what the detention centers are doing. They're actually saving lives. It's actually the total opposite point. While these people can be processed, either, you know, let in or sent home, whatever. But obviously Vox, I'm a Jewish historian. Yes, we should call border detention centers concentration camps. It isn't just accurate, it's necessary. No, it's wild hyperbole. There is not going to be a genocide of Native Amer uh, Central Americans under Donald Trump. This is not a way of killing them off. This is a way- I'm sure that Three Arrows is about to point this out, but a concentration camp is not necessarily a death camp. Most death camps are also going to be concentration camps because you generally have to hold people at a location while setting up the logistics for their mass execution. But a death camp, it, 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 a concentration camp doesn't have to be a death camp. Um, like, we've, we've gone over this before, and I'm sure Three Arrows is about to get to it, but concentration camp, a place where large numbers of people, check, especially political prisoners or members of persecuted minorities, members of persecuted minorities, checks. So, you know, cons will disagree with this, but the idea that undocumented immigrants are not a persecuted minority is ludicrous. Are deliberately imprisoned, check, in a relatively small area with inadequate facilities, double check. Remember all those pictures of the border camps in like 2018 and stuff? Holy shit, yeah. Sometimes to provide forced labor or to await mass execution. Not this. They're not given max execution. Um, wasn't there some reporting of forced labor? I don't think that was a ubiquitous thing. Still, this is a sometimes thing. The term is most strongly associated with the Nazi death camps, blah, blah. Um, so yeah, no, it, it meets the definition of concentration camp. I think it's acceptable to call these immigration camps concentration camps, not only because they meet the technical definition, but also because the rhetoric used by the Trump administration clearly politicized it. These camps at the border were not just insufficient holding facilities for immigration. The way they were being talked about was pretty specifically an attempt by the state to demonize and contain uh, a, a minority, a violation of their international political rights by denying them asylum, making them political prisoners, as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, and, and the threat of these people was used as a propaganda tool by the Trump admin. So, I, yeah, I think it's a perfectly apt description, in my opinion. You're wrong, ICE made it a policy to start sterilizing Hispanic women. Yes, ICE did sterilize some Hispanic women. I don't, that wasn't like an every camp thing, but this did happen, yeah. Um, I, 
I think it was like, the people who presided over this, as far as I'm concerned, are in the same like tier as the Nazi doctors. Uh, th it was like, wasn't it for a lot of these women, it was like they had something that needed to be taken care of by a doctor, and the doctor, while having them opened up, was like, yeah, let's just take this out too, you know? Because they didn't like the Hispanics, so... Yeah, these were full-on hysterectomies. I mean, they yoinked the entire goddamn institution. When she talked to these women about the hysterectomy, the women, quote, reacted confused, one explaining why they had one done, end quote. The woman told Project South that it was as though the women were trying to tell themselves it's going to be okay. When I met all these women who had the surgeries, I thought this was like an experimental concentration camp. It was like they were experimenting with their bodies. Mr. Wooten also expressed concern regarding the high number of detained immigrant women at ICDC receiving hysterectomies. She stated that while some women have heavy menstruation or other severe issues that would require hysterectomy, everyone's uterus can't be that bad. Everyone he sees has a hysterectomy, just about everybody. He's even taken out the wrong ovary on a young lady, a detained immigrant woman. She was supposed to get her left ovary removed because she had a cyst on the left ovary. He took out the right one. She was upset. To go back, take out the left, she wound up with a total hysterectomy. She still wanted children, so she has to go back home now and tell her husband she can't bear kids. She said she was not all the way out under anesthesia and could hear the doctor tell the nurse he took out the wrong ovary. What the fuck? Alright, well... No, this isn't an ICE policy. This was a couple of rogue doctors. I don't think it's fair to apply what's happening here as a general standard for the, um, for the deten for the the concentration camps at the border. However, the fact that this is happening at all is pretty noteworthy. Um. Oh yeah. Speaking of ontologically evil, the doctor here. Jesus. All right. Okay. Okay. We're on a tangent here. Let's. If keeping them safe while we figure out what's going on with them. I say we, while the 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 border uh, border agents and whoever is involved with it figure out what to do in line with the law and the process. Uh -huh. Usually now would be the time to go over this point by point, showcasing reports about awful conditions and preventable deaths in these camps, allegations of forced labor and sexual assault including minors, maybe some footage that would contradict how awesome it is to be there and interviews with people on the ground saying how desperate they are to leave. But with this one, we're going to try something else. Let's try a hypothetical and stick with me on this one, I promise this will make sense. Imagine there is a country somewhere, and this hypothetical country is currently facing a large influx of asylum seekers or immigrants for whatever reason. These newly arriving people don't speak the same language and are from a part of the world that is seen as fundamentally different than the country they're trying to get into. As always, the usual social tensions arise and the typical debates are being had about how to handle the situation, and the political right of this country calls for swift deportation and denying these people asylum, saying we can't take in the whole world, etc. You know how this goes. The debate goes back and forth and the usual articles are being published showcasing each side of the argument. Here's how one of these might look like. The increasing immigration of this new group of people is gradually becoming a serious problem. Although one may be far from wanting to deny these unfortunate ones the right to asylum, it must not be forgotten that a large proportion of these arrivals are made up of people whose immigration and settlement in our country meets justified concerns. Pity for them must not blind us to the fact that they are largely unfit for integration into our society. Naturally, there are also voices in the press arguing for the opposite, and opinion pieces like this are also published. In the public, increasing voices can be heard that demand legal measures against the newly arriving asylum seekers. These people are deemed black marketeers, smugglers and criminals, or as work shy. All these arguments are aimed at taking the strongest measures, i.e. to cram them into concentration camps or force them to leave the country. A measure that destroys so many livelihoods should not be based on bold allegations. Even less it should be based on demagogic agitation that doesn't live up to the facts, nor is capable to effectively remedy existing damage. Truly, the recovery of our country cannot be brought about by the use of force against a small, defenseless fraction of the population. Eventually, the authorities respond to increasing right-wing pressure and set up facilities to concentrate asylum seekers and immigrants without citizenship to ensure swift deportation. Shortly after they are set up, though, reports of unsanitary conditions and inhumane treatment spark public protest, and a female politician decides to tour some of these facilities to get a picture of the situation. The conditions she witnesses in these camps are absolutely appalling to her, and in front of parliament she claims that detainees are forced into wooden barracks, infested with bugs, and that the air in these buildings is unbearable. At night they only have sliced up blankets to protect themselves from the cold, and she also talks about the detainees being served substandard food, 
including rotten potatoes. Continuing, she says, it's not just our responsibility. Oh, also remember, when stuff like this happens, it is a political decision. Our country is unfathomably wealthy. If there are people who are cramped together in tiny facilities with uh, tattered blankets and rotten food, it is because that is what we chose to give them. Uh, you know, there are no accidents here. Um, it's the same with prisoners. You know, prisoners in America, many of them have their cafeteria food subcontracted out to the lowest bidder. And uh, these people will get maggots in their, in their meals, you know, these, these prisoners. Um, and like, this is a choice. We do this deliberately. Um, and this is, as far as I'm concerned, a form of torture. You know, these may not be death camps, but the suffering of the people in these camps is a deliberate and intended product of their design. The only thing to which I'm sympathetic is the cramped space, because we do get a lot of undocumented immigrants from our southern border, and it is difficult to build facilities to accommodate all of them during the temporary, um, you know, vetting process, the whole, you know, the whole nine yards. I am sympathetic to this and this only, though more could be done there as well. But the blankets and the food is something for which there is absolutely no excuse. but the one of every upsetting person to bring this shame to an end as fast as possible and closes her report with categorizing the previous occurrences as severely damaging to the reputation of our country a different public figure also decides to tour these facilities and comes to the opposite conclusion stating all in all we can say that this whole thing has been blown out of proportion and is used for political agitation by the left okay enough of this what was this all about well I just thought it would be funny showing a number of events from a different time and place, considering how much it echoes the current situation in the United States, without you knowing where this happened. But enough of the funniness, here comes the gut punch. As you can Has probably already guess, our hypothetical country is not hypothetical at all. It's very real, and this all happened in the early 1920s in the country of Germany. I had to switch a few words for the quotes like replacing Germany with Ooh. our country, but the rest is all kept the way it was. The news piece opposing the asylum seekers was published in the Karlsruher Tageblatt on the 3rd of January 1920, and the opposition piece was written by Albert Einstein a couple of months later. The female politician touring these camps was Mathilde Wurm of the Independent Social Democratic Party, and the quote about the concentration camps being totally fine and used as a political tool by the left also is a real quote. Now, why does this even matter? Apart from being one of the more interesting historical parallels, it matters because the immigrants in this case were Jews, fleeing persecution in the Russian Empire and seeking refuge in Germany. It also matters because these were the first camps on German soil to literally be called Konzentrationslager. Not that it should matter since facilities with the name Concentration Camp have been around since the Spanish-American War, and if you don't know the difference between what a concentration camp and what a death camp is, maybe just, you know, shut your face about it. <laughs> so yes, these are concentration camps. Anyway, the reason why I like this German example so much is because in retrospect, we can clearly see it as being a stepping stone to the eventual genocide of the European Jews by Nazi Germany and its collaborators about two decades later. And not just Jews, of course, but other minorities like Romani who were also stuffed into the same earlier described concentration camps in the 1920s. And keep in mind that- Do you think when climate change takes toll, there will be a massive exodus of people from the Caribbean to the Americas? Okay, I actually wanted to mention this because this has been my doomsday prophecy for a little while but it looks like things are outpacing my expectations. Just a moment. This might potentially be a good thing. I'll explain why. Here. This probably isn't a perfect or updated map but this is um, areas of extreme risk uh, with climate change due in part to weather and in part to rising sea levels. So you see here, Bangladesh, uh, you know, I think this area will be like famines and stuff. The blue areas here are where people will have to flee from if they don't want to die. That's the gist of it. Uh, you see a good chunk of Mexico here, Central America, a lot of it, um, and then big swaths of Western Latin America. So historically, everywhere, but also here in the U.S. as well, the fear of a flood of immigrants has often been used to justify, you know, um, martial law and like a far right bent. Remember back during the 2018 um, midterms, Donald Trump lied about there being a caravan of Latin Americans coming up to invade America. He sent the National Guard down to protect the border and then nothing happened because it was totally made up. It was a fear mongering tactic to get more votes during the midterm. Just complete, absolute dishonesty. 
nothing happened. I remember. Um, yeah, my thought has always been that when global fascism arrives, when the great happening arrives, it'll be because of this. In, um, in 20 to 30 to 40 years, I don't know when exactly, of course, it'll be a gradual process, you're going to have hundreds of millions of climate refugees fleeing famine and drought uh, in Central Africa, hell, in parts of America too, don't get me wrong, um, Latin America and Southeast Asia especially is going to be gigafucked by like tsunamis and shit or whatever. Um, but you have to understand everything that happens down at the southern border between Mexico and the United States is nothing compared to what's going to happen in some of these places. How do you think China is going to react to literal hundreds of millions of climate refugees trying to move north into their less inhabited provinces? They're going to be gunning them down at the border. Not an exaggeration. These will be the largest mass graves in human history. Um, my main concern has been that the severe political circumstances will force fascism out of almost every country on Earth. Um, or at least prompt it. Force uh, conflict with it. But America is leaning towards fascism sooner than that. We aren't even facing the consequences of climate refugees that much yet. Which makes me wonder if this is something we can't get out of our system early. Fascist governments never stand for that long, you know. Even if we lose now, is it possible that the fascists fall apart soon enough that we could respond more responsibly to the climate refugee crisis? I'm not sure. Is that a positive? This is a very bleak positive. We're, we're, we're beating the curve. We're, listen, lads, we're flattening the curve, okay? We're just trying to keep fascism from reaching critical mass. If we get it out of the way early, we don't have to do it later. It's like getting chicken pox when you're six, you know? You want to get it done now so you don't get uh, the worst version when you're an adult. This is a weird kind of optimism, isn't it? Well, it's kind of what I believe. I guess we'll see. So you're accelerationist now, Vosh? Well... It's more like America is on an accelerationist path, whether I want it to be or not, and I might as well make the best of it, right? Like, it's, it's more like I can't stop this from happening, so let's try to be... Let's try to think about how this could potentially, you know, work to our benefit. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Optimistic doomerism, we can only hope. Couldn't it just prolong the fascist movement? I don't know if fascist movements can really last that long. Yeah, I don't know. What's the longest... Especially with the Republican Party. The Republican Party is... It's not like they're the CCP, you know. Yeah, no, Franco lasted a while. I feel like the Republicans might be a little bit too frothing at the mouthy for things to last that long with them? I don't really know. Yeah, I'm not sure. That when Germany's first domestic concentration camps were set up, the country had a left-leaning government which openly condemned anti-Semitism. The Nazi party barely even existed at this point and was far from entering the national parliament. So now would be the time to write your comment about how the US concentration camps already existed under Obama to totally own me or whatever. About two to three years after being established, Germany's first domestic concentration camps would close their doors again because the conditions continued to spark public protest and operating them became too much of a fiscal burden for the government. Be that as it may, the arguments from the right when it comes to human rights abuses in the name of immigration enforcement don't change over time, it seems. If these camps are so horrible, why don't they just stay where they are? This is just a political ploy by the open borders left, etc. And I can only speculate what these people feel on the inside, but the smug scoffing when someone brings up past atrocities to say, you know, maybe we're going down a dark path and cramming vulnerable minorities into a confined space and then neglecting them, comes from a total inability to see societal violence on a continuum. Before we jump into that though, I couldn't resist to point out at least one thing in the video we used as a jump off point for this topic. Near the end, our narrator shares an article written by Paul Joseph Watson which suggests recently resurfaced photos of AOC at a facility for minors are staged and taken at an empty parking lot because there are no children visible like two feet away from the fence or something? 
Now, of course, because it's Paul Joseph Watson, it's a bunch of nonsense, and Snope has since debunked the article and verified that the photos were indeed taken at the Tornillo Tent City, which housed 2,900 miners before it was shut down in January due to safety and health risks. I never saw, I never got this, man. This was like the weirdest thing for conservatives to try to pretend was an own. It's like, there are no kids there. Yeah, the photo was taken at the fence. The kids are off camera. It, it They were to the left. They're to the left. It wouldn't be a Sargon of Akkad video without a conspiracy theory, I guess. Anyway, back to what I was saying. Besides the ones I already listed, the main reason about showing a parallel between 1920s Germany and 2019 America is to hammer home the fact that large outbursts of violence against minorities should be understood as the end of a process with lots of steps preceding it. When it comes to collective acts of violence, they are not unexplainable sudden eruptions, but... Oh, holy shit. I've seen that photo before, but I never noticed the bottom right. That's a fucking hangman's noose leading into a, um, a Jewish star. Jesus Christ. I mean, I guess I shouldn't be surprised. It was the night of broken glass in Nazi Germany, but like, geez. That's fucking evocative. to collective acts of violence, they are not unexplainable sudden eruptions, but recurring social processes with a start, a midsection, and an end. Not being able to understand how these events unfold is laid bare in the responses to Nazi comparisons, and what it seems to boil down to is, why are you invoking the Nazis? It's not like the US puts people into gas chambers. I can't even really blame people for setting the bar as high as committing an actual genocide, because it's really hard to imagine a modern democratic country sliding into what looks like a collective race insanity as in Germany in the 1930s and 40s. It's hard for me too. And it was hard to understand for the people immediately after the fall of the Third Reich as well. How could a modern country that brought forth so many advances in culture, science and equality just 180 like that in such a short amount of time? It's not like Germany was an exceptionally anti-Semitic country compared to the rest of Europe. A historian once speculated on what would happen if a time traveler from 1945 arrived back in Europe just before the First World War and told an intelligent and well-informed contemporary that within 30 years a European nation would make a systematic attempt to kill all the Jews of Europe and exterminate nearly 6 million in the process. If the time traveler invited the contemporary to guess which nation it would be, the chances were that he would have pointed to France where the Dreyfus affair had recently led to a massive outbreak of virulent popular anti-Semitism. Or it might be Russia, where the Tsarist Black Hundreds had been massacring large numbers of Jews in the wake of the failed revolution of 1905. That Germany, with its highly acculturated Jewish community and its comparative lack of overt or violent political anti-Semitism, would be the nation to launch this exterminatory campaign would hardly have occurred to him. This question of what happened in Germany was one of the many things people hoped to be answered by the Nuremberg trials. You know, let's just ask the higher-ups of the Nazi regime, or at least analyze them. After all, some of the main perpetrators like Hermann Göring were in the hands of the Allies, and pretty much the entire Western world was curious how they justified their actions. These were the guys who had planned and executed one of the most horrible crimes in human history and cultivated all these ideas about subhumanity and the destruction of Bolshevism and the struggle between the Aryan and the Jewish race. Really some insane stuff to an outsider. And learning about the scale of their crimes let many people... At yeah, the, the fucked up thing here, like, this is where the term the banality of evil comes from. Because the overwhelming consensus after the Nuremberg trials was that most of the Nazi leadership were cognitively and psychologically normal and that most of them, like, relayed the details of the Holocaust and their explanations and justifications for it with the same, like, calm, matter-of-fact roteness that you would get from a clerk explaining why they file things on their desk the way they do. There was no, like, supervillainy present in any of their behavior because supervillainy doesn't exist, you know? Supervillainy is the biggest cope in the world. It's the... Supervillainy is the comforting belief that sufficiently evil actions have to be accompanied by a sufficiently evil demeanor that in order to do something really really bad you you have to be like a different kind of person there has to be something extravagant and special and different about your evil but now nah, folks a lot of evil is really just like mediocre guys who touch waitresses thighs when they go out to eat who also happen to be like um stockholders in nestle voting on CEOs who they know will quietly promote and cover up, like, the use of child slavery in East Africa. That's like, like, that's it. Like, that's, yeah, there's, a, oftentimes it really is just people, just quiet, mediocre people, just casually doing unimaginably horrible shit and barely even thinking about it. Like, that's, that's really how it is.
it's funny, the things that make Trump an exceptional, I don't know, figure, a uh, figurehead, aren't even the things that make him a bad person. Trump's buffoonery is what makes him, like, an exceptional figure from an outside perspective, not his evil. He doesn't come off as particularly evil when he talks. Like, he doesn't, right? He comes across as stupid, first and foremost. When I watch Donald Trump talk or do stuff, my first thought isn't, you know, what a supervillain. That's not even my last thought. Most of my thoughts are just like, this is a this is a funny buffoon. That's like the main thing that he conveys to me, you know, but the stuff that he's saying, the stuff that he does. The time to conclude that these people must have lost their minds and that there wasn't much of humanity left in them. The court psychologist at Nuremberg was a guy named Douglas Kelly, and he conducted pretty detailed psychological that tests hair. with these main perpetrators. One test he promised himself conclusive results from was the Rorschach test, you know, showing someone an abstract ink blot and then interpreting their answer. They're not used as much anymore, but at the time they were seen as extremely reliable. So he conducted the tests and sent the results to leading Rorschach experts to get an idea of the perpetrator personality, for lack of a better word. Now, for a psychologist of any prestige, really, this must have been a dream assignment. Everyone wanted to know what was up with these guys and to get a shot at being the one who deciphers the personality of the Nazi leadership, who could say no to that? Surprisingly, all of them could. Not one of the 10 experts responded to Kelly's inquiry to isolate distinct character traits from these tests. There were some excuses, but it really didn't make sense that all 10 psychologists would pass on this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. About 30 years after this, a colleague of Douglas Kelly gave away the real reason nobody responded to their request, and it's not because they didn't even look at the material that they were given. They all did, most likely. But they also knew that the world was expecting them to find a common personality structure of the very worst kind, and the None of them wanted to be the psychologist to come forward and say there was nothing wrong with the tests. That was it. Ten of them passed on it because they all looked at the results, and knew there was nothing there they could report on. That's fucking bleak. The thing that frustrates me right here is that, um... The thing that frustrates me is that they shouldn't have sent a psychologist. They should have, they should have sent a sociologist. This is... The thing is, a socio... Like, all the writings that have taken place on the Nuremberg trials since, all the meaningful analysis of the behavior of the Nazis have been sociological in nature, not psychological. Psychology doesn't have that much to do with it at this point. You know, what happened here, you can analyze people's thoughts and behaviors if you want, but really, these are social phenomena channeled through powerful people. Um, but nobody wanted that answer, because the idea, what everyone wanted, was that these people had some kind of evil brain. Nobody wanted to think there was anything common about any of these men, but they were all common. None of them were exceptional. They could have been just as easily born in any other country in the world and have lived perfectly ordinary lives. Nobody wanted to believe that because that means anyone could be them just as well as they could be anyone. So they hoped that psychological analysis would reveal something wrong with them, but it didn't. Material simply didn't offer that. You can ask yourself if you wanted to be the guy to be handed the material for someone like Hermann Göring, head of the Luftwaffe, head of the four-year plan, and then respond with, well, to me, this guy looks pretty normal, actually. Only Kelly himself had the guts to write in his closing statement, from our findings, we must not only conclude that such persons are neither sick nor unusual, but also that we could find them today in every other country on Earth. Yep. That's kind of unsettling, isn't it? Not something you would want to hear from someone psychoanalyzing some of the worst criminals in human history. Now, you might say, well, these people were just pushing papers around and having meetings. It's not like they were the ones pulling the trigger. Sadly, we seemingly can't find any refuge in that explanation either, because in 1980, two guys named George Krenn and Leon Rappaport took a look at the psychology of members of the SS, the grunts of the Nazi regime, so to say, and concluded that the vast majority of the leadership and their subordinates would have passed the psychological tests of the US Army or Kansas City Police with ease. They put the number of outright psychopaths in the SS at 10% at best, which really isn't that high, all things considered. Another example that caused perplexity among a lot of people was the evaluation of Adolf Eichmann, often described as the architect of the Holocaust when he was put on trial in the early 1960s. One of the consultants evaluating him claimed that Eichmann was by all accounts normal and added, at least more normal than I am, after examining him. A bit after that, a different clinical psychologist by the name of Molly Harrower dug up the material Kelly had gathered at Nuremberg and decided to give it another try. She mixed the material of Göring and the others with a couple of unremarkable profiles and sent them to a bunch of experts, but this time, they didn't know who the people they should analyze were. She also asked them to take a guess of what these people did in their day-to-day -day lives. And at least this time, the majority- I know this sounds like a phenomenally stupid statement, but I cannot believe that the 60s started 15 years after World War II. That just seems so wild to me. Whenever I think World War II, I think grainy black and white footage 
of like square jawed men in army uniforms. And when I think of the 60s, I think of like hippies and second wave feminists and shit, you know? And then it's it's like, wow, they weren't even separated by a single generation. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. No, it's just, no, I, yeah, it's, you know. George responded, but no one even came close to guessing what kind of material they had been given, with the speculations ranging from civil rights advocates to the material being taken from psychologists themselves. Pretty mind-boggling stuff. On a somewhat unrelated note, four of the five top Nazi officials who were able to avoid a death sentence at Nuremberg all saw a chameleon in one of the Rorschach pictures. Not going to do anything with that fact, I just thought it was interesting. Anyway, it's not only that the vast majority of people in the Nazi regime or the ones committing crime in its name were psychologically speaking normal people, even the worst of the worst didn't even feel bad about their actions afterwards, and that's even scarier if you ask me. And most of these people went on to live relatively normal lives afterwards, working as bakers or police officers and didn't, or don't, because some of them are still alive to this day, suffer from insomnia, depression or anxiety. Contrary to their victims, by the way, who suffer basically their entire lives if they manage to survive. And here's where we get into the stuff that's really hard to process, so if you feel like rather not hearing some of these people try to remove themselves from their responsibility, maybe skip the next part. When we look at how the perpetrators talk about what they did, it becomes very clear that they have a self-image that would baffle anyone who is confronted with the list of all their atrocities. Take this quote, for example. Let the public continue to regard me as a bloodthirsty beast, the cruel sadist and the mass murderer, for the masses could never imagine the commandant of Auschwitz in any other light. They could never understand that he, too, had a heart, and that he was not evil. As the quote already gives away, this was written by the commander of Auschwitz, Rudolf Hess, in his biography, responsible for over a million deaths and probably one of the most evil people in history, but even he doesn't see himself as a bad person. Nobody it sees themselves as a bad person. You know, Zizek has an interesting uh, piece on this, which I'm quite fond of, how people delude themselves into thinking that they're not evil. Um, one is where you talk about Joseph Stalin. Uh, Joseph Stalin believed himself a man of history in the most literal sense. When Stalin killed people, and boy did he kill people, um, he did so in a kind of depersonalized uh, way. He thought of himself not as a man, but as an architect of historical action in a deeply materialist sense. If anything, it's kind of a perversion of Marxist ideology. Um, he's not a man because there are no men. There are only, you know, um, the forces of history and the material interests of the classes. Uh, that He was simply uh, a tremendously large and powerful gear moving in a great machine. You understand what I mean? Essentially, he depersonalized himself. He was no longer responsible. He was just a force of nature. Um, there was something similar that was actually done in an element, I believe, of Buddhist philosophy that was applied by the Nazis. It wouldn't be the only thing they stole from the Buddhists. The swastika is a Buddhist symbol. Um, but it was the idea of a kind of a cosmic determinism that absolved them of personal responsibility for their behavior. You know? Um, how, how to describe it? It would be... If you, if you are an SS officer at a death camp and you shoot someone in the back of the head, you know, a Jew or something, a defenseless person, you know, you can tell yourself you aren't doing that. The universe is doing it through you. You're just a component of a broader, um, of a, of a, a broader system, you know, a, a cosmic, uh, force that, uh, you know, moves through everyone. It's not just, just following orders. It's like the highest order of just following orders. It's, um, it's, it's, you're not just following orders. You are just an instrument of the universe acting on itself. That there are not individuals. There are only extensions of the same system, you know? And in that sense, you know, you can't really kill anyone. You can't do anything. You only live through... That would be considered the ultimate submission to authority? Well, obviously, this is a deeply submissive ideology. Um... But they're Nazis. They're authoritarians. It makes sense. This is a deeply authoritarian kind of spiritualism here. Not freeing at all. Actually, quite the opposite. Surfing the Kali Yuga, yes. To refer to what we saw yesterday, yes. Surfing the Kali Yuga. This is very similar to that, you know? It's not what you do. It's you ride the wave of the spiritual force that compels human behavior, you know? Yeah. Zen Japanese imperial philosophers were like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
GGX said Buddhists justified killing by saying the universe had just found a way to put the knife inside of someone, not that you're personally stabbing them. Yeah, stuff like that. I know it sounds psychotic, but, I mean, it has happened. I have a feeling that a great many of the Nazis who worked at the concentration camps don't feel that they were evil because they feel that there was a great motion in place, you know, a wave of which they were a part, um, towards a desirable end. And their participation in it was just a, 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 a cosmic quirk, you know, just an, just an incidental component of this broader, highly depersonalized system. Now, mind you, this is cope, because these people are individualists under other circumstances. It's not as though these Nazi guards would round up a criminal and go, ah, the criminal did not steal the bread. The bread simply arrived in the possession of the criminal through cosmic... No, 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 no. This was a self-applied depersonalization, not a ubiquitously applied one. So, again, keep in mind, this is not a coherent or consistent philosophy being applied. It is a way of depersonalizing yourself so that you don't feel personally responsible for the actions you're committing, which you politically agree with the outcomes of, but might personally have qualms about. You know, in a kind of innate or um, intrinsic way. Those are blatant misinterpretations of karma? Yeah, of course they are. But hey, what, what religious group doesn't blatantly misinterpret its own philosophy? I hate spiritualism. It's baffling, really, and leaves one kind of hopeless about human nature. At least it does me when reading quotes like this. Here's another horrific, but sadly not unusual, example of this attitude. I made the effort, and it was possible for me, to shoot only children. It so happened that the mothers led the children by the hand. My neighbor then shot the mother, and I shot the child that belonged to her, because I reasoned with myself that, after all, without its mother, the child could not live any longer. It was supposed to be, so to speak, soothing for my conscience to release children unable to live without their mothers. This was said by a police officer sent to Poland, and the real weight of the statement kind of gets lost in translation, because the German word that he used here translated as release also means redeem or saved when used in a religious sense. And this quote really jumped back into my mind when I read an article about a former ICE spokesperson who tried to garner sympathy for the deportation goons and saying, These are parents themselves. I know people aren't sympathetic to deportation officers, but they have a rough time with this too, and I think more so under this administration. Although I should explain the similarities here. Nazi propaganda never framed the act of killing the people they deemed subhuman as an act that you should enjoy or feel good doing. They only framed it as necessary. And here's where the real dynamic of societal violence comes into play. The earlier quote from the police officer saying he did his best to only shoot children is set in the context of him trying to appear as a good, upstanding person. He is living completely outside our moral axioms. This is what racist propaganda does to a society. Being able to commit acts of cruelty, be it killing someone or stuffing them into a concentration camp, becomes an act of virtue and the perpetrator is framed as acting righteous because he is able to overcome his or her own doubts and still do what they are told is necessary. Yeah, this is a big part of it too. You know how soldiers will often champion their ability to do what needed to be done? This was a pretty common thing, especially after Vietnam. Most people, I think, most Americans felt pretty good about their involvement in World War II. Vietnam, not so much, you know. So an innate moral good is assigned to the value of being able to do bad things, even though it's hard. See, it's a kind of um, ethical trickery where something becomes good because it is bad. You see, you didn't want to do the bad thing, but you did and you were able to, and that's hard, which makes it good. It's complete nonsense, really. It's, it's incoherent ethically. Um, but it's a very common sentiment, especially for soldiers. And cops. Cops as well. Yeah. Now, I get this might all sound very abstract, and it's hard to imagine oneself going through that process, so I'll give you an analogy that really helped me understand it. Imagine someone offering you money to hurt another person with a sharp knife, maybe unintentionally killing them in the process. It's not someone you know, but I think it's safe to say that most of us would not take that deal. But if you apply a different frame of reference, it turns the entire thing on its head. For the example just given, think of yourself not as a random person, but as a surgeon who is supposed to perform an operation. That kind of changes everything. And the whole thought process now active in your mind of, well, of course, cutting people open is wrong, but it's done for a good cause. It's not like the surgeon enjoys what he's doing, but the end result counts, etc. Is what the Nazis and other murderous regimes utilize to make their foot soldiers commit atrocities. And you don't even have to be a diehard anti-Semite for the societal process to change your perception. 
This police officer was part of a conscripted police battalion who were too old to been through Nazi socialization or the brainwashing. They also hadn't been desensitized by war, and they all came from the city of Hamburg, which was and still is one of Germany's most left-leaning cities. On top of that, the members of this police battalion were explicitly given the choice to not take part in the killing of innocent people by their superior. But still, the vast majority of them still did it. I didn't come up with that surgeon analogy myself though, it's from social psychologist Harald Welzer, who wrote a book with the very straightforward title, How Normal People Become Mass Murderers, which I can't recommend enough. The last question that's still unanswered is how does a society even get to that place where its frame of reference becomes that twisted? At the beginning there's always some sort of grouping taking place, so a subset of the population is defined as something else, and then a categorization is filled with meaning. Typically that's because of racism, but that's rarely enough. Remember? Essentialization. You group, you categorize, that categorization is given meaning. Enough, and just because a racist is elected into office doesn't mean there's a genocide down the line. Although, of course, it emboldens those attitudes and gives people who are already racist more self-confidence because there's less of a social stigma around calling Mexicans rapists if the president has already done it, for instance. Anyway, for large acts of violence to occur, it always requires a bunch of people to be either apathetic or provide cover for what is happening. And how one becomes that person is arguably even more important than the type of person we talked about before. Now, another analogy. Imagine it's the first day of a new school year. Before the teacher comes in, the school bully shows up and singles out one of your new classmates and briefly makes fun of him. Let's say that happens every day for a couple of weeks and gets more intense over time. Now, of course, you could say something, but you know, you're happy that you're not the one being singled out. You don't want any attention directed towards you and nobody else says something, so why should you? Kind of sucks for that one kid, but you know, who doesn't experience something like that in school, you tell yourself. Now the year goes on and your one classmate is increasingly bullied until at the last day of school, the bully comes in, punching your classmate in the face. You and the other classmates are now way less likely to report this to a teacher than you were at the beginning of the year. And that is because we tend to rationalize decisions we made with some sort of ambivalence after the fact to fit it to our own self-image. Therefore, subconsciously, it often appears easier to reaffirm a previous decision by repeating it rather than questioning it and thus admitting that all your previous decisions might have also been wrong. Yeah, it's not just about desensitization, it's about making you complicit in the behavior of people worse than you. This is one of the ways the Republicans are so good at weaponizing their voter base towards very radical ends. Because if you have a group of Republicans who are like, kind of latently homophobic but not great like let's say you have the let's say the majority of republicans are homophobic in the sense that they don't think that marriage should be between two men or two women and they think that it's like kind of weird but like you know like at the end of the day they re they respect people's choices like they may think you're going to hell religiously but like politically you know they think you should have the right to do that and i do think that's the majority of homophobia in this country by the way but then let's say a small minority of the Republican Party is go going on to say, you know, oh, well, it's not just that they're doing this in their homes, they're actually groomers, and then it goes into the whole all gays are pedophiles thing, and then it's like, well, pedophilia is morally aberrant, you know, we need to lock them up beforehand so they don't do anything to hurt our children. And the initial group of Republicans, if you would just ask them straight up, do you think gay people should be locked up for being gay, would never have said yes. Seriously, a lot of Republicans, whether you they say this or think this, they don't believe that. But if you give them the leading logic, it becomes more and more difficult for them to back off because they're already invested in the predicating logic, you know? You've already got them a couple steps up the ladder, um, which makes it that much easier to bring them up the rest of the way. And if you realize where the ladder is headed, which in this case would be the genocide of gay people, um, once you're already on the ladder, it's a lot easier to keep moving up and a lot harder to just get off it entirely. That's the whole point. Once you get people involved in basic, the basic argument, you see this all the time. Remember how during Gamergate, the prevailing beginning argument was crazy SJW feminist anti-gamers are cringe, and a lot of these people ended up being full-blown neo-Nazis? You take one step at a time, but every time things get a little bit crazier, the only way for you to back off entirely is to realize that all the steps you've taken up until that point have led you here. You're on a trajectory. The inertia carries you, and it takes a hell of a lot more effort to stall that inertia um, than it does to just continue moving in that direction. It is a kind of sunk cost fallacy, though not one people cognitively recognize. It's a subconscious bias. 
This is how actions that were previously unthinkable become possible over a very short amount of time. The job of something like Fox News or YouTube's rationals in this analogy is to play the role of the guy who, if somebody does say... Oh, sorry, one second. I just looked in YouTube chat and I saw, but Vosh is doing the same thing. They are all evil and shit like that. You're replacing something like Jews with something else. Both bad. So I agree. Uh, saying anything is bad is like saying the Jews are bad, because all things are exactly the same and nothing means anything. That's what I get for looking at YouTube chat. Hey, this kid is getting bullied. I fear he might receive some physical abuse if we don't do something. To respond with, this is ridiculous. I can't believe you would smear the school bully like that. And in fact, I consider this deeply offensive to all the victims of physical abuse around the world. The just described process is also why so many people seem to disregard their stated principles like free speech or anti-corruption when it comes to someone like Trump, because they'd rather be a hypocrite than admitting that they were wrong. It starts with, you know, Trump is an idiot, but I really dislike Hillary, so yeah. Then, I'm a Trump supporter not because of specific policies, but because he makes the left so mad, until you find yourself saying stuff like, as long as children in concentration camps are not screaming at the top of their lungs, I don't see much of a reason to be concerned. Nobody on the right side of history thought this was the answer to a flawed policy. <laughs> I tell you what, Francis, a child's whiny cry would have a lot more traction with me if I wasn't a parent, but I'm afraid at this point I have become inured to the whiny cries of children, because children give that kind of whiny cry all the time. Can't have a biscuit. Remember when, remember when he said, remember when during the trans arguments he said, um, it was asked like, um, well, is an adopted parent still a parent? And he was like, well, no, not properly, but he, he's an adopted father. Does anyone else remember that? Like, where he, where he was like, oh yeah, I guess adopted parents aren't real parents, but he has an adopted daughter? Yeah. Whiny cry. Doesn't want to go to bed. Whiny cry. Doesn't want, can't find its favorite toy. Whiny cry. I'll tell you what, Francis, I'm actually really relieved that that's the kind of cry that you exposed me to, because if it had been a high-pitched, sustained cry of fear and pain, then I would have been like, yeah, okay, something's really wrong. Historians like Richard Evans, who wrote the Third Reich trilogy, which is fantastic. Like, uh, it's just, that's the level we're on. This was years ago, too, but, like, Sargon's been a fash for a while. Um, you know, it's just... <laughs> I'm, I'm actually delighted to hear the screaming of children at this concentration camp. This pitch isn't nearly high enough for it to have the degree of torture and physical mutilation or associate with, uh, with uh, Auschwitz, you know, just... Typically don't start the analysis with Hitler's first electoral victories, but go back as far as Bismarck. They talk about this harder, Sargon says, sweating profusely. Scream harder, he yells at the children. Spreading of scientific racism in the 1890s, or local anti-Semitic politicians pushing the boundaries of what is acceptable in political discourse. First you stretch what is acceptable to say, then you push what is acceptable to do. The discrimination of Jewish refugees in Weimar, laws like prohibiting Jews from owning dogs under the Nazis, these are just as much part of the genocidal process as is pulling the trigger years down the line. This is why Nazi comparisons are not only- Do you think Sargon would have been a Nazi sympathizer in Britain during World War II? I think he's a Nazi sympathizer today. I mean, we're all products of our environments, but like, yeah, there's his his ideology right now is closer to that of Nazi Germany's than it is to any liberal British ideology. Yeah, just absolutely. He was literally on Twitter on one of his banned accounts talking about like disproportionate Jewish control of businesses, and he's what lit an avowed white nationalist. You know, it's not not that subtle of a connection. Valid, but necessary. An example apart from immigration where I would consider this perfectly valid would be the attack on trans people by the Trump administration. Removing them from mm. their jobs if they serve in the military. Rolling back protections against housing discrimination. There are countless examples of this administration going out of its way to harm this community. And a lack of pushback against government action like this will only lead to more severe actions down the line as mm. it did in Germany and so many other places. This is from 2019, how prescient. Places. The sheer horror of what fascism looked like in the past can be blinding for the emergence of fascism and radical nationalism in new forms. Of course, when hearing the word fascism, we think of the mass party, brown shirts marching through the streets and people throwing the Hitler salute. But just because that is missing, we shouldn't be tricked into thinking the far right has adapted and accepted the idea of minority rights and democracy. 
in an earlier version of this script, I had a couple of lines here saying that it didn't take much for the German right to pivot from it's just those Jewish refugees we don't want in the country to actually it's all Jews and we shouldn't accept the American right to have any qualms about something similar either. But reality outpaced this script and that pivot has already happened in parts. Typically, I like to end a video in summarizing the point of all my previous rambling in one or two sentences, but this time I'll have to tag in historian Timothy Snyder, who summarized these points better than I ever could, so I'm just going to use what he said. To forbid analogies makes the Holocaust irrelevant to future generations. If an American child can identify with Anne Frank, an American child might ask what it's like for immigrant children to be separated from their parents. To forbid analogies is to forbid learning and to forbid emphasizing. That, sadly, is the point. Uh-huh. It's the exact same reason that um, Republicans will say, like, don't politicize school shootings or whatever. Um, they want to deny you the rhetorical and historical tools necessary to understand where they're coming from. Because a historical understanding of the rise of Nazi Germany is one which immediately and directly condemns the Republican Party. So they don't want you to be able to make those comparisons. This is one of the reasons why I adamantly insist on making at least 18 Nazi comparisons every single day. You know? When, when they, listen, okay? When they said, uh, never again, I listened. I'm keeping the torch alight over here. 100%. Me, me at the ice cream shop, when, uh, I ask for two scoops, and I get, at best, one and a half, you know? Hitler-esque. I twirl, I twirl the cone. I twirl the cone in my hand, and I, uh, I, I, I remember Hitler's bunker being stormed. You know? Um... All right. You know who else drank water? <laughs> uh, God damn it. Fuck, it's warm in here. Holy shit, it's like 90 degrees. We have learning to do. I kind of want to see this one. Diversity in World War II. Hello, everyone. Hi. It's Oscar season again, which doesn't have anything to do with today's topic, but it gives me an excuse to talk about a movie which will probably receive a couple of awards. The movie I want to talk about is Christopher Nolan's Dunkirk, specifically about a take on it by a certain YouTube person. The video we'll be looking at is made by a guy called Brooks, who does God news, damn it. comedy, commentary, freedom, and also hosts oh, happy a YouTube, birthday episode, John. Hell yeah. YouTube channel, No Bullshit. His video on Dunkirk is titled Dunkirk is Problematic, which I encourage you to look up to make sure I'm not misrepresenting him, if you can make it through the video, that is. Now, I personally don't have any big problems with the movie Dunkirk and very much enjoyed it, so the focus of this video doesn't lie on the movie itself so much, but more about the outrage by Brooks, as you will see shortly. Let's have a look at what he has to say about the movie. Dunkirk tells the story of the 1940 Battle of Dunkirk, where French and British soldiers struggle to evacuate the city in the beginnings of World War II. Sorry to interrupt here, but this will be important later on. The movie Dunkirk doesn't tell the story of the Battle of Dunkirk. It tells the story of the British evacuation during the battle. It's more about Operation Dynamo than anything else. It's a minor point, but keep that in mind for later. And while the movie was masterfully done with wonderful acting, direction, score, and pacing, there's still a few problems. For starters, there's no black people in it. How dare Christopher Nolan make his movie historically accurate? What an asshole. That's not gonna fly in this day and age. Not in 2017. We need to black or brownwash at least one of the sympathetic main characters in order to be politically correct in current year. I suggest they replace the Commander Bolton character. Sure, he was played beautifully by Kenneth Brownoff, but we don't want this Shakespearean-trained, oscar nominated actor in there. Ew. Let's put a random minority celebrity in there. Someone like 50 Cent or Shaquille O'Neal would be my- I know, I think at the time, no bullshit wasn't open about it, but he is a neo-Nazi. He was talking with um, uh, Mr. Medeker about how he tries to like quietly red pill his audience on the Jewish question. So his like incredulous, you know, retardation is, you know, it's, yeah. In retrospect, it's uh, fairly obvious. Well, yeah, I mean, it always was, I guess. Much better. Sure, they can't act, but at least their skin's not white. Now, besides the point that there are black people in the movie, although only very briefly, Brooks doesn't seem to know that there are, like, real black actors other than 50 Cent and Shaquille O'Neal. Whatever, maybe it's a joke. At this point, you might be asking yourself what someone might have said to make Brooks get this unhinged. Well, 
let him explain. But back to Dunkirk. Here's what one reporter from the USA Today had to say about the movie. The trail of timelines can be jarring as you figure out how they all fit. And the fact that there are only a couple of women and no lead actors of color may rub some the wrong way. <sighs> but in all seriousness, for real now, clearly this guy at USA Today isn't concerned with being historically accurate in non-fiction stories. Unfortunately, this is the only thing Brooks cites from this review in USA Today, which is titled Christopher Nolan's Dunkirk examines World War II heroism up close. And I know exactly why. Because the sentence right after the one he cites in this obnoxious voice is, Still, Nolan's feat is undeniable. He's made an immersive war movie that celebrates the good of mankind while also making it clear that no victory is without sacrifice. In fact, the part that Brooks features in his video is the only one in the entire review which could be seen as negative. And the part about not enough minority representation is phrased in a way that it's not even a critique of the movie really. The fact that there are only a couple of women and no lead actors of color may rub some the wrong way. This isn't criticism of the movie, but only a suggestion for moviegoers who might expect something different. How outrageous of USA Today to even suggest that people who care for this stuff might not enjoy the movie as much. If you read the full review, it becomes very clear that the writer loves the movie, as is showcased in the original title, which you can see in the link. Review Christopher Nolan Excellent Dunkirk Explores Heroism Innovative Fashion. But Brooks doesn't seem to care about that. If he needs something to be outraged about, you can be sure he will find it. But besides on that, his suggestion about the Navy officer being played by a rapper sounded kinda of familiar when I heard it the first time. And then I remembered where I read something like this. It was in the Breitbart article about the exact same thing, which reads, Also, it would definitely have added a new dimension had James Earl Jones been cast as the salty old royal naval officer called out of retirement for one last trip across the English Channel. Or if Ice-T and Snoop Dogg had been given the role of two aging rappers who parachute from a Dakota to administer weed to the desperate troops. Or if Oprah appeared in a cameo as Queen Mary, welcoming the returning troops after their desperate voyage. But it wouldn't have been historically authentic. I didn't even realize somebody in chat just said, no BS hasn't posted a video in a long time. The last one was seven months ago, and then past that it's all a year or older, and all these videos have pretty low views. It's, it's, it's easy to forget. Um, but no bullshit used to be like one of the biggest, yeah, these views, holy shit. I guess it's because every video of his is basically the same, so it does get tiring. When did we switch from the one emoji to the, to the logo? Where'd the emojis go? And we have nothing. And then we just have the logo? Huh. Now I'm not saying that Brooks stumbled over this article in his favorite fake news outlet and just copied what's in it with a couple of slight changes. It's just a weird coincidence, probably. Although the article was released four days before Brooks' video was uploaded. Make of that what you want. The Breitbart article finishes with a sentence, The guy from USA Today. He does know its history, right? Well... I know it's history, so let's listen to Brooks for a bit more and look at some of the claims he makes. Because I can't think of anything that would bring me out of a World War II movie's immersion more than seeing a woman in the French or British military. Because guess what guys, those armies were almost completely made up of white men. Now Brooks starts off by saying he can't- I know this isn't exactly a novel um, point on my end here, but I do think it's remarkably funny that these like alt-right bros will um, watch a war or history movie with wild historical inaccuracies or play a video game where in World War One you have like a hand portable submachine gun or, you know, people are surviving bombing runs or you can heal after drinking like a flask of whiskey or something. And then they, they scream about historical inaccuracy if they see a woman or something, you know. This is not exactly a, um, an uncommon uh, uh, bit of hypocrisy here think of anything that would take him out of the movie more than seeing a woman in the British or French military. Which is really weird because there were women in uniform at Dunkirk as part of the ATS, which was the women's branch of the British military. Not only that they were at Dunkirk, a part of them was even evacuated alongside the men, although most women of the ATS were evacuated later in Operation Ariel. It's weird that he picks this as a deal breaker for him and not things like, you know, these guys not wearing helmets in an active battle zone, or that this are supposed to be 300,000 people, or that the pamphlets in the movie look nothing like the real ones, 
almost like he is the one being obsessed with gender and race. Anyway, he then goes on to say that the British and French army were almost completely made up of white men, which, I can only assume, stems from an assumption that a lot of people have about these armies. It weren't really only France and Britain who were at war with the Axis. It was the French and British Empire. In 1939, the population of the British Empire was about 25% of the entire world's population. And naturally, they drew a lot- That's fucking wild, dude. Jesus Christ. Holy shit. They had so many colonies. I guess that's why they called India the jewel of the empire. ...out of their forces from there, just like the French did. Even when talking specifically about Dunkirk, which was fairly early in the war so Britain hadn't fully mobilized its Dominion forces yet, there were still about four contingents from British India. You know, the part of the British Empire which provided the largest volunteer army in history, making up about 2.5 million men of the British forces by the end of the war. Holy sh- I didn't know that. Jesus Christ. It really is crazy, like, where we get our history from, right? Like 2.5 million, that is a colossal, a, a volunteer army too, with no conscription. That is colossal. Like you could, Jesus, yeah. One of them, named Jimada Maula Dat Khan, even earned an Indian Distinguished Service Medal for gallantry at Dunkirk. For quote, showing magnificent courage, coolness, and decision. When his troops was Ooh. shelled from the ground and bombed from the air by an enemy, he promptly reorganized his men and animals, got them off the road and under cover under extremely difficult conditions. It was due to this initiative and the confidence he inspired that it was possible to extricate his troops without loss in men or animals. Now the Indians only made up a fraction of the troops at the beaches of Dunkirk, but this doesn't extrapolate to the fact that the armies of World War II were almost completely made up of white men. And because he hasn't embarrassed himself enough yet, Brooks doubles down in saying, 1940 soldiers in these battles were almost all white men. I'm sorry, but it's true. Well, I'm not sorry, and it's not true. And I really have no idea which battles he is talking about here. Is he talking about the Battle of Dunkirk, like he claimed the movie was about? If he had taken the time to not even open a history book, but just take a quick look at the Wikipedia page for the Battle of Dunkirk, he would have seen that a significant part of the French forces, who were the ones holding off the Nazis to make the evacuation even possible, came from French Africa. And these troops later went on to form two-thirds of the Free French Army under Charles de Gaulle, and will continue to fight for the liberation of France from Nazi rule. And even if I would grant Brooks the Battle of Dunkirk... If you... One thing that will really fuck with your head if you think about it so much of the matter of fact info that you have about history and the world is just stuff that you piece together from consensus you know there is so much shit like in in terms of what you know about the world like me not knowing two and a half million indian volunteer forces participated like or anything like that this is the equivalent of like just believing uh the, the, you know the whole time like oh yeah dude well World War II was like when we fought back against Germany, but then and then you realize like actually like no you didn't actually fight back against Germany like there was act the the fucking secret moon base was the real final fight you know we just don't talk about that because it's like weird and you know like Germany was a part of it yeah but like obviously the moon base was like a huge part of history and you're reading through it it's like wait how the fuck didn't I hear about this what it's okay. It, like, you don't... <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. It's, like, people... This is one of the reasons... You know how when I... You know how when I argue sometimes with the far right and they say really matter-of-fact stuff? Like, well, Western civilization has con done the most contributions to science in all of human history or whatever. First of all, it's kind of a non-falsifiable statement because Western civilization, depending on where they want to draw the line, could go all the way back to, like, ancient Greece. You know, like, they could be pulling together a pretty wide... But, like, there's so much stuff we don't know about. How much do you guys know about, um, like, the history of China, right? Like, w guys, think, think of, like, the bloodiest civil war. Uh, the French Revolution, the American Civil War? No. What are you, fucking infants? That fucking Chinese Civil War, where the one guy thought he was the brother of Jesus Christ, had like 30 million dead people. The, yeah, the fu Taiping, the Taiping Rebellion, yeah. Like, that, that, that's like, yeah, uh, yeah, dude, the Civil War was super deadly, man. Like, 600,000 Americans died. It's like, oh! <laughs> 
Wait, it's fuck. The, uh, the only thing I'm trying to stress here, albeit um, not very well um, at all, is that so much that we don't know about history, there's so much we don't know about history, and it's so fucking important. And what we perceive to be important is really just determined by cultural consensus, not by the actual importance of any given event. You know? All we really learn is a collection of tidbits and trivia that we tell ourselves as part of a story to overemphasize our culture's relative importance in world affairs. Um, but everyone does that, you know? There's no objective history. All of history is, uh, you know, choosing what to tell and what not to tell. Um, yeah, I don't know, just... In 1940, there was still the East and West African Campaign, the Mediterranean Middle Eastern Theater, and the Chinese Front. World War II was not a white man's war. It was a world war in every meaning of the term. Let's listen to Brooks for a bit more. So with that said, I really don't see how having only a couple women in the Dunkirk movie was even a problem, but I knew if we looked hard enough, someone would complain about it. If we looked hard enough, someone would complain about it. Brooks himself just gave away the purpose of his video there. He desperately needs something to be outraged about that he can sell to his audience as another sign that the SJWs are taking over. Even if it's just a suggestion in an otherwise extremely positive review. The real problem is SJWs have gotten away with this complaining so much that they're finally jumping the shark. You give them an inch and they take a mile, just like the Nazis did in 1940. Oh wow, I thought the people on the left were the ones falsely accusing people of being Nazis. And besides that, what is this give a finger take a mile comparison to the Nazis even supposed to mean? The only thing I can think of where this would fit is the annexation of Czechoslovakia by the Nazis following the Munich Agreement, but that happened two years before 1940 in the Battle of Dunkirk. Anyway, let's listen to one last clip from the video. I personally think fiction and non-fiction movies should both be free to cast whoever the fuck they- Oh yeah, dude. Um, God, the older skeptic and conservative videos would do this too, where sometimes they would just have like tits up on screen or whatever. Like, probably because they know who their target audience is. Might actually be pretty decent, um, you know, uh, um, audience retention on their part. Want. It can be all white or all black or diverse or whatever. Whatever they like. SJWs and film critics who focus on the skin colors of actors this much are just sad, sad people. Desperate losers who have nothing better to talk about. Yeah, it's totally the writer of the review in USA Today who is overly focused on race and gender and who is a sad, sad person with nothing to talk about. Not the person who makes a six and a half minute video about how outrageous it is to even suggest such a thing. And don't ask me about this sudden change of backdrop. This doesn't look like a bitch in northern France, but maybe he has a hard time keeping his audience attention. And that's pretty much hey, it. Hey, that's the joke I made. Okay, this video wasn't really like a history video. It was just like one of the earlier anti-skeptic things. I want to watch another good one, like a good solid... I have time for one more good solid. Was well, Hitler a socialist? It's probably a good one to watch, right? It's just 42 minutes. Ah, I will watch. I will watch of it what I can. We're basically just trying to to brush up on our on our on our info here. Um, I will watch what of this I can, and after this, at the end of the hour, I have to go. Why are you taking his views? A channel's been defunct for a year. Go sub to Three Arrows. If enough of you sub, we can make the 300 tick up to 301. That would be fun. Bosch is killing time till stream sends. Wait, this is useful. What do you... Okay. Uh, wait, Vosh, are you not subbed? I don't sub on this channel. Fine. There, I helped. <sighs> well, here we are. At the question that is apparently occupying the great minds of our times. Was Adolf Hitler, the dictator of Nazi Germany, a socialist? Although this is probably my most requested video, I did want to do it for quite some time. Partially because I thought that it's a position only fringe demagogues would espouse, but to my disappointment, but not surprise, it seems to become a more and more mainstream opinion in American conservatism. Even Mr. Facts Over Feelings himself is repeating it. And not to forget quite recently, the son of the President of the United States of America. I'll talk about why I dislike engaging this discussion so much at the end, but for now, let's tackle the arguments today presented by conservative pundit Steven Crowder and a few others. I have to admit though that I was honestly baffled by some of the arguments here because I think I have rarely seen this level of being highly deceptive or flat out wrong combined with a large dose of smugness. And let's begin with Crowder's explanation for why it's important to categorize Hitler in that way, which should give you an idea of Crowder's understanding of the topic. Economic authoritarianism is still authoritarianism. I wrote about this. 
Okay, I'm really sorry. I love you guys. I've gotten like a dozen or so emails of people offering resources or to like help with the game idea that I rambled about last night. Please do not make me regret enthusiastically autism info sharing with you guys. You know? I'm just I'm just saying. The mo if you ever if you ever email me about something, it stops being a personal thing and becomes a work thing. Just keep that in mind, you know? It it instantly the moment it's in my inbox, it becomes a an, an it's right alongside my business obligations and is therefore immediately less interesting to me. I'm just saying. Not that I don't appreciate the interest and help and advice. That Hitler, what do we hear about Hitler? He was super right wing. Right wing. Right wing. Nazi stands for National Socialist German Workers Party. Okay? So put that in your back pocket. Now, let me get to something people will say. I know what you're going to say. National socialism, not democratic socialism like Bernie Sanders. There's a huge, one is fascism right wing, one is not. They're both socialism. Democratic socialism always becomes national, nationalistic socialism. By definition, it has to. Why? Okay, the United States is not a democracy. You throw around the term democratic as though it's, it's noble. Um, no. We're a constitutional representative republic. Why? That's important to know. It's important to know we're not a democracy. That's because democracy is mob rule. The reason the United States was framed as a constitutional representative republic is to make sure that the rights of the minority are still protected from the majority. Otherwise, the majority can just vote and screw the minority. You're, you're more liberal. You should be on board with that. Democracy, by definition, would inherently bad, be bad for minorities. So. Am I saying Bernie Sanders is like Hitler? No. So obviously, democracy, which includes protections for the minority, is democracy. Democracy doesn't necessarily do, like refer specifically to majoritarian democracy with no minority protections. That's stupid. Of course that's stupid. I don't know why I bother. I don't know. Right? I'm not I'm not doing a debunk segment. I'm watching I'm, I'm I have to remember. I'm watching three arrows here. I want to learn history from three arrows. I want to learn things. Oh, but the ideology is the ideology that lends itself toward authoritarianism and fascism because of an increased expansion of the state. Now, why is this so important? Going back to representative uh, government. Well, Hitler used the idea of democracy, mob rule, to infringe on the rights of the minority. How do we feel about the I, I can't do the three arrows. You have to step in. I, I, I makes me want to respond. I, I'm just, I'm skipping ahead. I don't have to listen to this. I'm here to learn. I know the setup. Jews, the, the rich, the national. I am a republic which wasn't its official name, but it was a constitutional republic up until the 1930s with a parliament and a president and all that jazz. By the way, the group in this picture sitting on the far right side of the German parliament, that's the NSDAP, the Nazi party, opposite to the far left side of the parliament where the communist party was seated, not coincidentally as you might have guessed. Also Crowder doesn't seem to know that democracy is a form of governing, while a republic is a system of government and the two are not mutually exclusive. And while the US isn't a direct democracy, neither was Nazi Germany. It was a dictatorship not of the mob, but of the party in power. Hitler and his party didn't have the absolute majority of the votes when seizing power for Germany, and Hitler wasn't voted into the position of Chancellor, but was appointed by President Paul von Hindenburg. Hitler managed to become a dictator by playing his cards right in a time of extreme crisis for the German economy and democracy that had been going on since the financial crisis of 1929. Funnily enough, Crowder also mentions the financial troubles that led to Hitler's rise in his article, echoing the claims of the far right at the time that Germany's financial woes were strictly the fault of the victors, and also claims the crisis lasted for 15 years, which is longer than the Weimar Republic even existed. This is the terrain we're traveling into, folks, so strap yourself in, because it gets even wilder, and frankly, quite embarrassing.
But for now, let's hear Kronos' arguments for why Hitler was a socialist. No! Hitler promised employment for all. Of course, was a self-avowed socialist. Innovative public work schemes uh, gave workers increased benefits. He increased jobs by increasing the state, not allowing wages to rise with prices because he wanted people working for the government. He ensured everyone had a job. Big education, free daycare. You had basically an entire generation who were raised by the state. Nationalized health care, uh, up to an 80% tax. Uh, gun control, of course, implemented gun control. Abortion was radically pro-abortion. Blame on the one percent back then the one percent were jews so i think this is a good point to jump into Crowder's article about this topic since it's easier to take everything point by point instead of responding to all statements at once the first thing you'll see when opening Crowder's article is this quote attributed to hitler at the top of the page we are socialists we are enemies of today's capitalist economic system for the exploitation of the economically weak with its unfair salaries with its unseemly evaluation of a human being according to wealth and property instead of responsibility and performance and we are determined to destroy this system under all conditions well that seems pretty damning seems like hitler was a socialist after all if these were actually his words which they're not the actual arbiter of this quote was Gregor Strasser, a high up in the National Socialist Workers' Party who wrote a pamphlet called Thoughts About the Tasks of the Future in 1926. Now who- Seems like a cool guy, I wonder what's gonna happen to him. Who was Gregor Strasser? He was the de facto leader of what one could call the more anti-capitalist wing of the NSDAP up until 1932. Due to the intentionally vague language of Hitler and the Nazi platform, a bunch of people flocked to the party, who Hitler himself didn't necessarily agree with politically. This led to strong division inside the party and to the establishment of two different camps. One was the group around Gregor Strasser and his brother, who genuinely saw capitalism as a broken system that needed to be replaced, and the folkish nationalist wing around Hitler, who didn't see it that way, and Hitler himself was always more interested in coming to power than in genuine policy goals of the party. The Strasser group of the party is often described as the left wing of the party, but in my opinion this is very misleading because if we look at some other statements by Gregor Strasser, the differences between him and the for instance social democrats become very clear. Taken from the same pamphlet of which Crowder got the other quote from, The spirit of our national socialist idea has to overpower the spirit of liberalism and false democracy if there is to be a third Reich at all. Deeply rooted in organic life, we have realized that the false belief in the equality of man is the deadly threat with which liberalism destroys people and nation, culture and morals, violating the deepest levels of our being. We have to reject with fanatical zeal the frequent lie that people are basically equal and equal in regard to their influence in the state and their share in power. People are unequal. They are unequal from birth, become more unequal in life, and are therefore to be valued unequally in their position in society and the state. Not very egalitarian there. And remember this guy is seen as to the left of Hitler and the Folkish nationalist wing of the party. He also actively took part in the failed Hitler Ludendorff coup in 1923, which sought to overthrow the Democratic Republic and establish a military dictatorship. Ultimately though, Gregor Strasser lost the fight for dominance inside the party against Hitler and resigned from all of his functions in 1932. His brother Otto had at that point already left the party and published a pamphlet called The Socialists Leave the NSDAP, in which he criticized the party leadership for putting tactics over politics and that they understood National Socialism to be an anti-imperialist movement who doesn't seek dominion over other people and countries. Looking back at stuff like, you know, what the Nazis actually did, it's very easy to see why they didn't get along. Gregor Strasser's resignation led to a radicalization of the folkish nationalist wing of the party, and two years later he was murdered in an event called the Night of the Long Knives, in which Hitler and others in the party leadership had several people killed who they weren't very fond of. Oh, that's what happens to him. Well. This whole affair shows that for Hitler the quest of power was much more important than ideological convictions. Holy shit, these are literally the current tankies. Actually, I think a better example for these people right here would be that um, this is closer to Jimmy Dore type stuff. So Tucker Carlson uses, uh, like Hitler, very ambiguous language about class liberation and workers' rights as a way of trying to lure people over to the far right. And there are people who are more legitimately left-wing in some economic senses. So, for example, you have somebody like uh, Sauger. I think that in some respects there are elements of Sauger's politics that are authentically left-wing, mostly economically. I don't think that changes where he really sits, though. And if there ever was, like, some, like, big, you know, like, fascist uprising, those people would be shot. Um, of course they would be, you know. There, there wouldn't be... At the very least, they would be disempowered. There would not be any real, um... Any, any real effort to make a pro-worker fascism. I don't even know what that would look like. Uh, 
or how his party colleagues interpreted the NSDAP platform. This is nicely summed up in Theodor Abel's The Nazi Movement. When Hitler joined the Drexler Group, meaning the German Workers' Party, he was primarily interested in creating a movement with himself as its prophet. The desire to put his idea into effect and the wish for leadership are inextricably woven together. To promote the idea, he had to promote himself. To promote himself meant to him promotion of the idea. Once Hitler had seized control of the party machine, he never again relinquished it, despite several attempts to challenge his authority. Notable among these was the Strasser affair of 1932, in the course of which Gregor Strasser broke away from Hitler, alleging disregard of party interests. Hitler's neglect of party concerns, however, is most apparent in his speeches. They contain no elucidations of the party program, no arguments in its favor. Instead, Hitler used his speeches to make dire threats against the government, foment the idea of resistance, and make converts to his leadership. Based mm -hmm. Right here. Um... Very rarely would they speak on their own party platform. They would mostly attack the opposition and um, suggest their own victimization at the hands of people who would see them silenced. Um, if that sounds at all familiar, then it should. Um, when you go up and you see Biden talk, his bloviating liberalism is so different to this. Biden pretty much entirely talks about the stuff that he wants to get done, but will never be strong enough to have done. Um, but if you take a look at, like, a, a DeSantis or a Trump type, you know, give their speech, it's mostly about how they're part of a persecuted uh, minority of conservatives who are fighting for your rights against the tyrannical establishment. Very little on the way of specifics, of course. And usually when they do offer specifics, it has to do with the specific ways in which they're going to fight against um, the things they say are holding them down. It's not really a broad uh, policy you know, proposal. Placing his speech on some local or national news story, he would invariably wind up with the same refrain. The German government was run by criminals who mocked at the nation and called down the disrespect of other countries upon Germany. We'll get into what Hitler thought about socialism a bit later, but for now, I'd like to ask you to take a look at the amount of time of this video that has already passed. And now consider that we're not even at the historical arguments yet. It's just the setup that requires so much cleaning up that it could be a video on its own. I hope you can see why I was hesitant in making this video, because honestly, all you can do is laugh. Anyway, the article starts out with a fake quote that doesn't support his argument. Moving on to the first historical point. Employment for all. After the depression, Hitler made a huge promise to his people. Employment for all. How did he do that? Roads and infrastructure. As Führer, Hitler's first priority was jobs, or the lack of them. German unemployment had peaked at 6 million due to the depression devastating the economy. With innovative public work schemes such as the building of autobahns, Hitler put every German back to work. He also advocated schemes as KDF, Strength Through Joy, which gave workers increased benefits for increased levels of production. This policy was popular and increasing with the proletariat who had seen their country decimated by the depression. By putting people back to work and making huge public spending, inflation was bound to happen. However, Hitler kept this under control by not allowing wages to rise with prices. This may have been one unpopular aspect of Hitler's economic policy, but there were many that people supported. So we could simply dismiss this argument because it's not factual. Hitler never promised employment for all, and getting unemployment down and the economy rolling again was less due to innovative public work schemes. But I'd like to combine this with Crowder's other points regarding Nazi Germany's economy. The innovative public work schemes that Crowder describes weren't really as innovative as you might think. In fact, there's even a name for this called the Autobahn myth. Because the idea of the Autobahn started circulating long before the Nazis took over and some stretches were even already built. Of course, those were then downgraded to country roads by the Nazis. What are your thoughts on modern work projects? I'm fully in favor of modern work projects. Um, I, don't think, I don't think modern work projects are, are like sort of predisposed to any kind of political alignment, you know, I think any type of government can get them done. In the United States right now, like, the fact of the matter is our infrastructure is dying and we need, like, radical action to fix that, you know? <laughs> That's, that needs to be handled. That's just because they wanted to exploit the idea of the Autobahn for propaganda. So Hitler jumped on the bandwagon of increased mobility and wanted to build 1,000 kilometers of autobahn every year, which should provide 600,000 Germans with jobs. In reality, though, this... He's got a goddamn shovel. Doesn't he look so... Doesn't he look really silly? He looks like a... He looks like a theater student, you know? Like he's he's got a, he's got a shovel with some dirt in it, but he's he's in full uniform. You know, you got the photographer back here. This dude's just looking silly. It looks like everyone's giving him a chance. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. yeah. Trump with the coal hat. You know, it's like all right, 
all right, Hitler, give it your best. You know, and he's he's like, ah, you know, giving a be his best shot. Look at the fucking million people back here that are, like, getting ready to applaud as soon as he dumps the dirt into this thing. That's what they're gonna do, you know? He's a dictator. These th thousands of people back here. He's going to put the dirt in there and they're going to lose their shit. And if they don't, they'll all get shot or whatever. One ...every year, which should provide 600,000 Germans with jobs. In reality, though, this goal was never met, and at the height of the construction, not more than 120,000 people were given work through this program. In addition to that, there were numerous problems during the project, and strike leaguers who wanted better or safer working conditions and a fair pay were sent to concentration camps. Of course you didn't hear about that in the Nazi propaganda. Wait, I'm sorry, this is, this is Mussolini looking goofy while doing farmer? Mussolini performs agriculture for the cameras. Oh my god, why is his head so big? He looks like he's doing the Putin thing, but like worse. I see where he's wearing swimming goggles. Because <laughs> he doesn't want any of the like wheat to like whip back and hit him in the face while he's pushing through it or whatever. It does look a bit like Danny DeVito, yeah. Instead, every newly built strip of the Autobahn was celebrated with the big inauguration and lots of camera teams to circulate the images in state-run media. In fact, these images were still propagandized even when the work on the Autobahn had come to a complete halt. They were successful, though, in connecting- look, look at how happy he looks. Look at him. This goofy little dictator. Yeah, throwing dirt on. Propagandized even when the work on the Autobahn had come to a complete halt. They were successful though in connecting themselves to the building of the Autobahn in the mind of the public, often to this day, as demonstrated by Crowder, while at the same time sweeping under the rug that the Nazis actually vehemently opposed the idea of the car only road, as they were called in Weimar Germany, because they saw it as an instrument of Jewish capitalism. But if the Autobahn project didn't put Germans back to work, what was it? Well, firstly, the Nazi government benefited from a general economic upswing coming out of the Great Depression, and also were able to spend money that had been saved previously due to the strong austerity programs by previous administration. They also skewed the numbers pretty strongly by forcing women and Jews out of the workforce and giving those jobs to German men. The biggest chunk of trimming down the unemployment, though, was by remilitarization and opening new jobs in the booming arms industry. Not that innovative, if you ask me. The next thing Crowder mentions is the Strength Through Joy program, which gave workers increased benefits. While it's true that the program gave workers a lot of benefits they wouldn't have had otherwise, for instance the KDF was the biggest tour operator in the country at the time, one of its goals was specifically to get workers away from Marxist or social democratic attitudes that had also promised better working conditions in the past. In fact, the program was intended to replace the demand for trade unions and prevent class consciousness from developing that might have become a threat to the Nazi government. The program didn't separate between the average worker yeah, remember, a critical component of fascism is class collaborationism. The idea that there is, in fact, no conflict between the worker and the bourgeois. Uh, instead, that they work together for the purpose of the race or the nation or whatever else, you know. But the one thing the fascist cannot abide is conflict between the worker and the owner. Um, because that, you know, the peace between those two groups is necessary for the, um, for, for the, the national attitude to remain cohesive. Because and their bosses in an attempt to get people behind the Bosh, if someone emailed you a really good sample script for your game idea with no expectation to pay, would you work with them? Nope, not a chance. But I love you. The idea of a community based on ethnicity rather than based on class. By the way, the trade unions I just mentioned were destroyed by the Nazis and their leaders were sent to concentration camps. Oh. And from that point on, workers had no way of effectively negotiating better pay or working conditions. Not something socialists were usually in favor of. The last point in this section of the article is that Hitler combated inflation that resulted from all the spending by not allowing wages to rise with prices, which is only part of the story. While price and wage restrictions did exist under the Nazis, the main tool in combating inflation was the introduction of something called the Mefo Bill, which was essentially a second currency issued by a bogus company set up by the Nazis. This allowed them to spend vast amounts of money on rearmament without their surrounding countries being able to notice when taking a look at the state budget. Essentially, it was just fraud, and when the time came to pay out the issued Mefo bills, the government printed money and uh, went into a world war, in which they plundered the conquered countries to prop up their immense spending. Not sure what about that is supposed to resemble left-wing policy, but okay. Anyway, I'd like to get into a bit more detail about the economy in Nazi Germany here, because if you would want to make the argument that Hitler was a socialist, or by extension the Nazi- Should have thrown this in there with the uh, Bay Area Nazi Club.
is more left wing, this would show in the end ectic economic policies. Of course, Crowder doesn't go that far, but unfortunately, this debate is bigger than just Stephen Crowder. The economy of Nazi Germany is a very complex issue, and there are frequent disagreements of its role in the Nazi state, but I'll try to limit it to what is relevant for us. If we look at the schematized version of how the Nazis organized the economy, we can see that there was quite a lot of overhead involved. Here's where someone from the Libertarian School of Economics might say that this resembles a planned economy, in the style of other self-proclaimed socialist countries of the 20th century. Important to notice here, though, is that the means of production remained in private hand under Nazi rule. If you were German, that is. In a planned economy, business decisions are made at the very top. In Nazi Germany, the owners of the means of production were able to make their own decisions, but were urged to act according to the interests of the Nazis. This lasted up until 19... This is why I call China's current government fascistic. That's what it is like there. Um, the, the bourgeoisie in China are given a lot of leeway to act of their own volition, as long as what they do does not conflict with the national interests of the Chinese government. 1942, when the war started to necessitate the complete mobilization of the German economy and society. From that point on, the economy was pretty much under complete control of the government as it was in several other nations taking part in the war. But keep in mind that this was done not out of ideological convictions, but just because there was no alternative if Germany wanted to continue the war. Economist and member of the Nazi party Hermann Reichler described it like this in 1945. The national socialist market system doesn't concentrate the economic activity of the individual in big stake monopolies like the Soviet Union. It rather adjusts the independent economic activity according to bigger guidelines. This market system eliminates false competition and forms the basis of a competition on the performance. I had a hard time finding an English translation to this though, so let me know in the comments if you find a better translation than this one. Essentially, owners could act freely within their firms, but face tight restrictions in the market. What this shows though is that the economic system of Nazi Germany didn't and wasn't supposed to resist. You said earlier fascist states don't last that long. Why has China lasted as long as it has? Um, well, China's changed quite a bit in the past few decades. When I say ch uh, fascist states don't last that long, I guess it should be a little bit more specific and say that fascist states which emerge through conflict, um, which thrive in conflict, which revel in conflict, which cause and create conflict, this is the issue. The primary, the, the thing that causes fascist governments to fail is agitation either internal or external. Um, internal agitation can be quelled to an extent. External is inevitable given the nature of fascist governments. It's really just a matter of how it develops. I actually think something that um, might be stabilizing China here um, is the fact that it has nuclear weapons, you know? Um, nuclear weapons, if held by Nazi Germany, would have really changed the, the course of the war um, because it makes outside threats less credible. Certainly, like, direct threats against the nation or to invade its borders. Um, also, how competently can you manage the internal, um, forces within a fascist government, you know? I feel like, I feel like China's government right now is held in high esteem by the people, in large part because of all the jobs and economic improvements they've brought about, but if those things were to be taken away it would be very destabilizing, which that will happen to China with the um, the upcoming population drop-off that they're going to experience when a bunch of people fall into retirement age. Here in the United States, though, no matter how the Republicans take power, it would not change the fact that they would be hated by a large portion of the American people. So maybe I should say fascist governments are less um, le less able to hold off uh, internal strife? Fire alarm beep? There was no fire alarm beep. We'll see. Resemble the one of a socialist country. I know in the US it's sometimes enough to deny bosses the right to personally murder their employees to be labeled a socialist, but outside of that, these words have very concrete economic implications. But the system we just looked at didn't really resemble a free market economy either, so why was it designed the way it was? Well, this is getting at why I dislike this whole debate so much. The economy of Nazi Germany can't really be compared to other systems that are around today without acknowledging that the economic system of Nazi Germany operated under a completely different paradigm than today's capitalism or socialism. The goals of the Nazis in regards to the economy were to be self-reliant in enabling them to wage war to enact their racist Lebensraum policies. A comparison that leaves this out is pointless, but more on that later. What this look at the economy doesn't explain are the anti-capitalist sentiments that the Nazis espoused, for instance, in their party program. Dinesh D'Souza frequently brings this up and claims that the party program could have been written by Bernie Sanders. More on that later. 
So what's with the anti-capitalist statements in the NSDAP program? To understand that, we have to go back a bit, and as so often, historical context is important. Ever since Santa and his elf came along to give the children caste consciousness, something called the social question had arisen in Germany. The mm. question was essentially what to do about the growing inequality, unfair distribution of wealth, and the alienation between the rich and the poor that came out of the capitalist system. When the Weimar Republic rolled around, this dilemma was still ever present and also amplified due to the ongoing failure of the system, and the parties offered different solutions to this problem. The KPD, which was the German Communist Party, and the SPD, the Social Democrats, were of the opinion that capitalism was an inherently broken system that needed to be replaced by a socialist system, although they had very different visions on how that system should look like. Especially the SPD was always going back and forth between their Marxist ideals and economic realities. The approach offered by the NSDAP and the German right in general was that capitalism wasn't a completely broken system, but that there were different forms of capitalism that needed to be separated. One form was what they called Schaffendes Kapital, what essentially translates to productive capital or capitalism. And the other one was Raffendes Kapital, which was their description of money-grubbing or greedy capital. And if you could just get rid of the money-grubbing aspect of capitalism, everything would be fine. Right from the start, the German intellectual right connected the idea of Raffendes Kapital with outside forces sucking money from the hardworking Germans. And as you might have guessed already, it This is literally the crony capitalism thing, yeah. This is exactly the same thing that capitalists, usually right-wing capitalists, will do when defending the system, you know, that it could work were it not for these subversive elements. And usually the subversive elements are either government regulation, foreign corporations, or if they're far right enough, you know, they'll implicate the Jews. It didn't take long for this concept to be connected to the anti-Semitic attitude of the German right, and that's how it fitted into the Nazi platform. It wasn't as much a critique of the capitalist system, but just another manifestation of xenophobic paranoia and wanting to appeal to genuine most of the population, while blaming them on non-Germans. One thing that Steven Crowder mentions in his video, but not the article, is that the Nazis cracked down on businesses. Expanding the state free school, bigger government, cracking down on businesses. So more people go to public school, raise their kids in public daycare, work for the government, and you remove the, uh, the, right. the, the power from the private sector, putting it to the government. Now, I can only guess what that's supposed to mean, but a frequent argument I read when someone tries to paint the Nazis as left wing is the nationalization of private businesses under Nazi rule. Shapiro also uses this argument when trying to explain why the Nazis were supposedly left wing. Number one, the Nazis were up a left. The Nazis were up a left. And, and... Right, the, the split between the National Socialists and the Communists was a split over power, not over fundamental principle. And the fact is that the Communists were fascists. I mean, Stalin was a fascist. Right? Hey. fascist was Whoa! Ben Shapipi hidden with the truth bombs. Whoa! Nobody gave you permission to be right. You are also a fascist, Ben. You know, we've got what parallels we draw. Incredible. Outflanked by Ben Shapiro. Incredible system of government that suggested that a top-down elite ought to rule every aspect of life, and the economic system that has been traditionally attached to that is one that involves seizure of private property and redistribution of it, which is something that both Hitler and, 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 uh, and Stalin did. And while it's true that the Nazis were very heavily involved in the economy and also confiscated a bunch of property, they also privatized a lot. In fact, they privatized more than any other Western capitalist country in that time period. After the Great Depression hit, Weimar Germany along with the other Western nations started nationalizing a bunch of services and companies. The Nazis, after they came into power, actually reversed that trend in Germany. For example, in 1932, the German government bought more than 120 million marks of shares of the Gelsenkirchen Mining Company. The Wait, so Stalin was a fascist, but Hitler what? Well, according to Ben Shapiro, fascism is a left-wing ideology, so they would both be fascists. Uh, lefty fascists, according to Ben Shapiro from inside the United Steelworks conglomerate. At the time, United Steel was the second largest joint stock company in Germany. After the Nazis took over, United Steel was reorganized so that the government majority stake of 52% was converted into a stake of less than 25%, no longer sufficient in German law to give the government any privileges and company control. This is only one of many examples, though. In the fiscal years 1933-1935 and 1937-1938, Privatization proceeds represented almost 1.4% of total fiscal revenues of Nazi Germany. Taken from against the mainstream Nazi privatization in 1930s Germany, 
Nazi economic policy in the mid-30s went against the mainstream in several dimensions. The huge increase in public expenditure programs was unique, as was the increase in the armament programs, and together they heavily constrained the budget. Exceptional policies were put in place to finance this exceptional expenditure, and privatization was just one among them. Nazi Germany privatized systematically and was the only country to do so at the time. This drove Nazi policy against the mainstream, which flowed against privatization of state ownership or public services until the last quarter of the 20th century. So does this mean the Nazis were free market capitalists, similar to how a lot of conservatives describe themselves today? No, making that statement would be making the same mistake that the people make who desperately want to paint the Nazis as socialists. The Nazis didn't privatize out of ideological conviction, but to build bridges to big industrialists and to foster more widespread support of the party. The economy of Nazi Germany doesn't resemble socialism nor free market capitalism, because it's not supposed to. It resembles the economy of a far-right dictatorship with specific ambitions in mind, similar to Franco Spain or the Brazilian military government of 1964 to 1985. Okay, so much for the German economy. Kroda's next argument is big education, and what he means by that is public education. And there isn't really much to say about this one, because public education was by no means a I think my brain is fried, I can't keep up with this. You know, I will give you credit on this. My brain is pretty fried as well. Today is the last day of the heat wave. Tomorrow it's going to go back to... Yeah, it's 92 degrees right, right now. now um, but tomorrow it's going to be in like the 70s or something, thank God. 65. 65 is the high? Uh, yeah, I think so. Fuck yes. Holy shit, that's a 30 degree drop almost in one day. 68. 68, yeah. okay, so 25. Still. Yeah. God damn. Okay. Now, we'll pick this up later. I want to do I want to do some streams where we just generally absorb more information about the rise of Nazi Germany, but what we did this stream was not that. I think we just ended up kind of lazily watching videos. Uh, we can try watching some or listening to some of the Iron Dice podcast stuff. I do want more on this. You know, I want more specifics. There are more parallels to draw. They're good videos. They're very good videos. Yes. Podcast and gaming? Uh, yeah. You should talk with him. I've had three arrows on before. After the Dilinka thing. Do, do, do. Yes, the last video. The first video that we watched was the one most interesting to me, personally. You should watch that documentary Zoe Baker posted about anarchist Spain. Uh, that could be fun. Yeah. There's probably a lot of worthwhile stuff to learn from Spain. Have you watched the alt-right playbook by Innuendo Studios? Yes, but it's not necessarily what we're looking for here. I want some historical knowledge. Um, we can do a proper research stream. I'll just have to... Uh, look through it. Is Zoe still mad at you? Oh, probably. The anarchists don't like me. 